Welcome. Thank you for coming to join to mark um, Universal Health Coverage Day. Um, it matters a lot, I think, in this year, perhaps even more than any other year. Um, we've got a wonderful program ahead of us. Um, insights from Myanmar, from Zambia, from across um, various countries. We've got very distinguished speakers, um, including uh, Jose Manuel Barroso and uh, Professor Sally Theobald and others. Um, Nigel Crisp will be giving a keynote at the end of the morning. Um, it's fantastic to be with you. Thank you. My name's Ben Sims and I'm Chief Exec of THET, Tropical Health and Education Trust. Um, and we're proud partners with Action Global Health and Students for Global Health, who you'll also hear from today. Um, reflecting on 2021, I mean, I feel quite emotional. It's difficult, it really is difficult to know where to start or to end um, describing the story of the year that we've just had together. Um, the second year, obviously, of the pandemic, but a pandemic that has, in Richard Horton's um, thinking, is best described as a syndemic, in the sense that it has exposed, exposed inequalities, the like of which I don't think we've been aware of. Um, in some ways, that exposing of inequality, of injustice, is a really useful thing, because by naming it, we can begin to address it. But we are in the middle of the most horrifying um, inequality, and that's particularly true of vaccine inequality, isn't it? So the pandemic has torn apart um, our world in so many ways. Um, if you look at the 2021 Sustainable Development Goal report, you can see that we've lost, I think, um, you know, in this decade of action, in this decade that was meant to be so positive, we've lost. Um, 10 years of development. I'm, I'm been reading, rereading the paragraph in the 2021 report, which says the current crisis is threatening decades of development gains, further delaying the urgent transition to greener, more inclusive economies, throwing progress on the sustainable development goals even further off track. I could go on, perhaps I won't, because it makes for such depressing reading. Um, it's not just the pandemic, is it? It's the devastating loss of um, UK aid funding. That experienced a loss of 48 million or so. Um, but if you can look at, for example, the story across the Stop AIDS website in terms of the impact on the HIV AIDS response, you can look almost wherever you like to see the devastating impact of the reduction in UK aid spend. And then we at FET particularly have been caught up in responding to the coup in Myanmar, this devastating um, military coup that happened in February the 1st that, that turned back the clock in terms of economic, but also in terms of uh, the development of healthcare systems. Um, and of course, more recently, we've seen the war in Ethiopia. Um, so it's been a really, really challenging year. There's no, no getting around it. Um, and I think it's probably worth saying that towards the end of the year, of course, we've also seen climate crisis um, feature more, more than, more than um, ever before. Um, I do recommend, by the way, the excellent Action for Global Health report on, on looking at the connections between climate crisis and health. Do read it. So how on earth do we find the optimism that's so necessary for us in order to move forward? Um, UHC Day is itself a sort of act of optimism. It's a waving of the flag. It's a reminder of the of, of our collective belief that everyone should have the right to healthcare. But how do we go beyond that? I think there are you know, some signs of hope. This year we've been celebrating the funding, UK government funding of the um, World Health Organization. Um, we've got the launch of a health system strengthening paper coming up next week. There are signs of optimism, but I think the one that sticks out for me is when I think of those health workers 
and the behaviour of health workers in this international year of the health and social care worker. When I think of how they have stretched and how they have worked so hard, including people like Sonia, who will speak later, not just in their day jobs, but also reaching across borders to express solidarity with each other. At FET, we've been incredibly galvanized um, by that observation of how generous um, and how international the outlook of health workers has been. Responding to COVID, of course, but also um, looking at the devastating secondary impacts of, of, of the pandemic. Um, I also in there celebrate something about the definition of health worker. I think the pandemic and the climate crisis teach us to have a much broader um, notion of who is a health worker. Um, one of the great um, moments of this year for us has been the, the site of cleaners in Nottingham University hospitals um, offering advice to uh, staff in Myanmar um, in, relation to, in, in relation to the pandemic. Um, and so we know that our, our, we need a very large coalition of people involved in advancing universal healthcare. Um, the HEAL campaign for us is, is of great excitement, and that is, is um, what we're, we're, we're celebrating most. The HEAL campaign um, brings together the voices of, um, of health workers who are prepared to speak out and make their views heard. Um, and the HEAL campaign also comes on the, overlaps with the theme of Universal Healthcare Day, which is leave no one behind. Um, so I think my note of optimism as I begin this day, which is full of people speaking um, about the work they're doing, about health workers at the front line, my note of optimism has to be, um, let us applaud, let us support, let us work alongside in solidarity with those health workers on the front line who are doing so much locally but also across borders internationally to advance the cause universal health coverage. This is not me clapping on a street corner and then saying, PS, you can't have your pay rise. It's me generally saying, let's walk in solidarity with health workers because they are achieving transformational change. And we'll hear from so many of them today. But thank you again for coming. Um, and I'll pass across to my colleague, Charlotte. Thank you so much, Ben. Thank you for those opening words. And I think you're right, hopefully throughout the morning, and we'll all walk in solidarity together, seeing the true impact that health workers and global organisations um, from Action for Global Health to Gavi are making um, to, the, to support the plight of health workers. So I'm really pleased now um, to hand over to Sister April, who, through her bravery, um, and her commitment to being a nurse and a health worker at such a difficult time um, is joining us from Myanmar. She's a nurse and has been working throughout the coup and the pandemic to continue to treat patients um, in the most difficult of circumstances. So I'm really delighted and, and very pleased to welcome Sister April this morning. Thank you, April. Thank you, Shella, and thank you, everyone. Uh, ladies, gentlemen, and distinguished guests, Mingalaba, I hope you hear me well. Uh, I'm speaking to you today from Myanmar on behalf of all our Burmese nurses, and I'm really honored to present a view from the front line of the crisis. My name for today is Nurse April. I graduated from a nursing university 13 years ago. I progressed in my career to become a nursing lecturer. Before the coup, I worked as a tutor at the University of Nursing, and I witnessed the progress in nursing education as we shifted the curriculum to the credit system. At the time, there was a special request and urge from the union minister, Dr. Mietwe, to produce more nurses across the country. So most of the nursing training schools received double intakes of nursing students. We had long ways still to travel, but we were making great progress. 
So all this stopped once the coup happened. Since February 1st, our world turned upside down overnight. Three days later, we saw the Red River movement initiated by medical doctors, and we also joined the movement. On the next day of February 4th, we stopped going to the office, which we call it Civil Disobedience Movement. As you may all know this already, other civil staff showed in solidarity by participating in the nationwide strikes coordinated by the Civil Disobedience Movement. So time passed by most of the nurses, many of my colleagues, they went home, but some, including me, we choose to stay in Yango and continue strikes on street. In late March, because of the brutal crackdowns, there were reportedly many casualties and injured people on the street. But although I was not there to care for those people, many of my colleagues and other nurses took the risk to care for those injured. What I've been doing after I could not go for the demonstration was that a group of our CDM teachers from our university, we set up the interim university council in early May. We vowed to support our students with their continuous learning and communication among ourselves. Very fortunately, we got a contact with Marcus in early June. Since then, we have been very, very grateful for their support. With the support from Marcus and the team, we have been conducting clinical teaching twice in a week so far. I have no idea where we would be at if we were not supported by this way. We also contacted our seniors graduates working abroad to help us teaching our students, and they have been supporting us as well. So there are many challenges along this, even though I was not on the list of 505 panic code issued by the military, I constantly fear of where might be my name appear on the list. So our nurses live in those fears. Some got arrested, some had to flee to border areas and some in prisons, including our student nurses. According to the AAPP data, there are 180 nurses have been issued warrants of arrest. So in fear of arrest or any dangers, I had to move out from my campus hostel and I managed to move to three different places and I've been very fortunate to get shelters with the help of my friends and family colleagues. So another challenge was COVID. You must have seen in news that we were hardly hit by COVID third wave back in July. The military restricted travels and night curfews make the transport of oxygen delayed and it slowed down the sufficient access to oxygen supply in almost everywhere. Many of my friends and colleagues had fallen sick during that time and tested positive, but most of them, like countless other patients, couldn't go to the hospitals because there are no proper mechanisms and procedures in place in public health sectors. Many people were desperately searching for oxygen for the men, family members with COVID. Almost everywhere, people were lining up with oxygen cylinders wherever it might be available, but the regime banned people from buying oxygen themselves that had made people panic more, causing chaos in large cities than elsewhere. It was heart wrenching. I did what I could. I was doing teleconsultation. I stayed on screen like more than 40 hours a day to do a small part which I could. It is heartbreaking to learn people were dying without getting those fundamental access. Just like me, there are hundreds of nurses who have been continually working for the people with whatever they have or wherever they are. Although they are on the run or they have to leave their workplaces, our nurses still commit themselves for helping people with health needs. So the terrible thing is our nurses got arrested, got killed or being issued for rent just because we practice our fundamental rights. The military accuses us of being criminals. Shell, can you go for another slide, please? Yes, thank you. This particular photo shows the nurse, our nurses being issued 505 panic code in military control nations TV. I have discovered that these worry days all have one reliable good movement. The minute one wake in the morning, I feel relieved to the point of bliss upon waking up in my bed to the realization that I have made it through one more night without being arrested 
that quite simple. I still find myself a free person. Here in Myanmar, I'm not alone in my plight. It has become a daily reality for so many people across the country over the past 10 months. Physically and mentally, hiding from the junta's deadly squats is an experience like no other. This is not a threat of wondering whether you were in big discovery that one remembers from the childhood games. It is a feeling of constant threat. The number of people who have gone into hiding or flat their homes is likely very significant, at least in the thousands, possibly in the hundreds of thousands, if we include everyone who has some reason to evade persecution by the regime. The number of the civil sub refusing to work for the regime is about 300,000 across the country, and many of them are in the hiding or at least keeping a low profile to avoid potential arrest. That's just a single category out of many. Perhaps there are many others like me sitting in their hideout across the country, anxiously hoping they wake up tomorrow morning as free people. The Myanmar crisis grows in scale every single day. Our population faces a catastrophe as healthcare workers either leave the country or do not continue their training. So I would like to finish by thanking you for listening our stories of our Burmese nurses and to ask the healthcare leaders around the world, please continue to help and support us until our country is free again. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sister April. Um, such, a, such a dreadful situation, such a moving account. And thank you again for joining us and for sharing that. I know that um, it's, it's not an easy position to be in and one that you risk um, joining us from Myanmar through. So thank you so much. And you mentioned there the work, Mark, the work of Marcus and others in the UK as well. And um, I know that the health partnership community in the UK is, is with you every step of the way, as are so many others on the call and health workers around the world. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for sharing your dedication, demonstrating your commitment. And we hope too that one day soon you will wake up free again. Thank you, Sister April. I'm now really pleased to turn to Sonia Creamy, who's joining us um, as an anaesthetist, but also as a research fellow from the Brighton and Sussex Medical School. Um, her work um, in the NHS, but also globally, as you'll hear with her experience in Zambia, um, is something again to celebrate and demonstrate once more um, the other ways that health workers around the world are supporting one another and standing together over the past year. So thank you so much, Sonia, over to you. Thank you very much, Salas, and thank you for inviting me to uh, come today to talk about my experience in the NHS and through our partnership, mostly our partnership with Zambia. Um, first of all, I'd like to also share what you've just said and say thank you to Sister April. I found that a really moving story that I think I'll remember for a long time. Um, so as you mentioned, I'm a anaesthetist in the UK. I work in operating theatres providing um, anaesthesia to patients that come for both planned and emergency surgery. And then during the COVID waves that we've had during the UK, in the UK so far, I've also worked as an anaesthetist on critical care settings, so intensive care units. Um, that experience has been difficult at times. Um, Caring for patients with COVID-19 has been very challenging for everybody, but at the same time, the NHS as a whole has been under a lot more pressure. So it's the task to make sure that patients who need their surgeries get their surgeries in a timely way and receive quality care has been a lot harder than usual because of challenges that we have with capacity and other difficulties in the NHS. When I think about my experience in Zambia and working with anaesthetists in Zambia as well, I think the themes that they experience are similar to what I've experienced in the NHS, but they are of a much greater size. The, they have significantly more difficulties in terms of staffing, the need for specialist staff, and are much more limited in the, the ability to upscale critical care services during a pandemic as we've been so fortunate to be able to do in the UK. The infrastructure that is needed to be able to care for patients with COVID-19 and those needing surgery has been much more limited as well. 
um, we've already heard mention of oxygen and that has been one of the most, um, I think one of the critical things that we've really learned from this pandemic, the gaps in op oxygen infrastructure. We've really learned that oxygen is the most, well, it's the most precious medicine that we have. And actually in many countries in the world that has been one of the limiting factors in this pandemic. Um, I also think about the fact that the challenges between COVID peaks in Zambia have been much greater as well. The need to ensure that everybody gets the surgery that they need, that training continues despite faculty being so deplete and needing to focus on COVID activities has been much greater. And one of my colleagues said to me recently with the news in the media of a new variant that we're facing at the moment, if we have another wave, it doesn't even feel like we're on a wave at the moment. It feels like the situation is so severe between the waves, it's more constant. And that really stuck with me as, as a, what they have been experiencing. So as had been mentioned earlier on, our partnership, like many other partnerships, has been working to try and find meaningful ways that we can support our partners, but also advocate for the issues that are affecting health at the moment, including vaccine inequality, including the need for resource and financial assistance for healthcare systems as well. When I think myself personally about what I have learnt in through my work in low and middle income countries and during this pandemic and how that's affected me in the NHS in the last 18 months to two years. By far the first thing that I think of is the impact that it's had on me personally. The ability, the, the opportunity that I've had to work with friends and colleagues through the Zambia Anesthesia Development Programme and other partnerships has brought me a lot of comfort and at times happiness and laughter that has really helped strengthen me and helped me with my role in the NHS. And that's got to be number one, to watch the successes that they have had in the last couple of years, despite such challenge, has been one of the proudest things I think I've experienced. But also there are more um, explicit things that I have learned as well. From my experience in low middle income countries, especially Zambia, I've noticed that I'm a lot more aware of resources in the NHS and things that we need to do practically to safely conserve resources, including during a pandemic. I'm also a lot more aware of issues like procurement that I wouldn't normally be involved in otherwise. And innovation has been huge in Zambia in the last couple of years. I've not only witnessed and been part of innovation relating to services and equipment and dealing with resource gaps, but I've then been able to tell my colleagues about in the NHS, but also innovation relating to education. A year ago this month, the Zambia Anesthesia um, Training Programme, uh, the Master of Medicine and the STP Training Programmes, held their final exams entirely remotely. And that's because it just wasn't an option to postpone exams when you're talking about graduating specialists in a country where specialists in anaesthesia are so few, the exams just must happen, whether there's a pandemic or not. And one of the things they did was run a remote OSCE, and it was the first time I'd ever seen or heard of a remote OSCE happening, and it was hugely successful. And I think it's important to bear in mind that the innovation that's happening in healthcare is happening in training as well. And there is this reciprocal learning and we can see what has been pushed and tried in other countries to help us in the NHS as well. So that brings me, I think, on to where we stand today with uh, talking about the need for universal healthcare and what we've really learned in the pandemic. As has already been mentioned, we've learned that there are huge health inequalities that exist around us. They exist in our communities, in our countries, our regions, and they exist internationally, globally as well. We also have learned about the huge gaps in health systems and health infrastructure and how that affects people's health. I've mentioned oxygen already, and that has really come to the front of the agenda, thankfully because we learned how precious this was and how many gaps there were. 
And we've also learned about the personal and professional needs of healthcare workers and how we need to look after each other and look after the profession to be able to care for our patients going forward. So my hopes for the future are that we continue to take these lessons learned and we really bear in mind that lessons learned are opportunities for progress. We make sure that those lessons learned they inform, they lead our actions, they develop our strategy going forward to ensure that we grow that infrastructure and strengthen things even further. We also recognise the huge impact this pandemic has had on the healthcare priorities that existed before COVID-19 happened. For example, maternal and child health, the effects of climate change on health. And we make sure that those stay at the front of the agenda too. And I hope that we understand that we need a united response for this, that each government, policy makers and all healthcare systems and workers must be working together internationally for us all to move the global situation forward. So I also see this as an opportunity for hope and I'm looking forward to the future. And I'm glad that health partnerships have been there during this pandemic because we've really learned the power of partnerships and how partnerships can adapt and how they can they can enforce and they can have meaningful change that really helps healthcare workers despite such difficult challenge. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sonia. And I think you've perfectly captured there the themes of today and, and the fact that we are all together for UHC and, and should very much acknowledge that moving forward from innovation to the laughter and happiness that you mentioned. There is lots to gain from one another. And I think almost every buzzword of that was used. So I'm, <laughs> it's lovely to hear that, um, you know, the reciprocity, the mutual benefits and the learning are, are always front and centre, but so too is that mental health and wellbeing, which is so crucial. I know so many health workers from yourself to Sister April have um, have really suffered with over over the past year, but coming together sounds um, like it certainly helped some of that those tough moments. So thank you so much, Sonia, for joining us. Um, I'm now delighted to hand over to Jose Manuel Barroso, who is the board chair of Garvey, the Vaccine Alliance. Um, he joins us through a video um, presentation, and, who, um, and as you know. Um, yes, it's, it's very busy trying to tackle, as Sonia mentions, the vaccine equity worldwide at the moment. So I'm delighted to show you now his video presentation with you all. Thank you so much. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, thank you to the Tropical Health and Education Trust, to Action for Global Health and Students for Global Health for inviting me to speak today. As everyone here knows, the goal of universal health coverage underpins everyone's fundamental right to live a healthy life. The goal of ensuring that good quality and affordable primary health care is available to every person everywhere, no matter what their income, will also be critical to achieving the Sustainable Development Goals. But the COVID-19 pandemic has amplified pre-existing inequalities in healthcare across the globe. And this has seriously hampered the incredible progress we have been making towards universal healthcare. So far, nearly 8 billion doses of COVID-19 vaccine have been administered worldwide, enough to protect everyone on this planet. Yet, that is not what has transpired. The vast majority of those have gone to the world's wealthiest nations. So while they have vaccinated more than 73% of their populations, in low-income countries, still only about 6 to 7% have received their first shot. This inequality is not only morally wrong, but is preventing the effective management of the pandemic allowing the virus to continue to spread and mutate in countries without widespread vaccination. As a result, we are seeing the continued emergence of new and potentially more dangerous variants, like Omicron. This will only serve to perpetuate this global crisis. Ensuring that people in all corners of the world have rapid and equitable access to vaccines 
and that countries have the capacity to get them out to people is the fastest way to end this crisis and put also our economies on the road to recovery. One challenge to achieving this has been a lack of healthcare infrastructure in many lower income countries. Even in the wealthiest countries, this pandemic has placed an enormous strain on health systems. But in low and middle income countries, where often health systems were already weak to begin with, the impact has been particularly devastating. Many economies were simply unable to cope with the impact of COVID and maintain their healthcare provisions while tackling the pandemic. There were numerous reasons for this disruption, including healthcare resources being diverted to COVID-19 and restrictions on mobility, which can both prevent people from accessing healthcare and health workers also reaching marginalized communities. Overcoming these challenges has been a monumental effort, but thanks to the remarkable work of countries and also of healthcare professionals, many have bounced back and restore the central health services, such as routine immunization. We now need to build on this to help create stronger and more resilient health systems and strategies that not only improve future pandemic preparedness, but set us back on the road to achieving universal health care. We need tailored quality and sustainable health care delivery strategies designed to target missed communities grounded in strong routine immunization and utilizing the full spectrum of approaches from fixed post immunization to community outreach and also other supplementary activities. This is something Gavi is very familiar with. For over 20 years, we have worked hard to protect the world's most vulnerable children against deadly and debilitating infectious diseases by increasing equitable and sustainable use of vaccines. Since its inception in 2000, Gavi has vaccinated more than 888 million children in the world's poorest countries, preventing more than 15 million deaths. Universal health care remains a core principle for Gavi, ensuring no one is left behind, working tirelessly to reach these marginalized communities and the two to 23 million children that still miss out on routine vaccines every year, including the 17 million zero dose children who don't receive even a single basic vaccine. But Gavi is not just about immunization. The work it does in expanding access to routine immunization, protecting all of the world's children, offers an opportunity to integrate a range of other essential health services. The infrastructure that Gavi puts in place, the supply chains, cold storage, trained healthcare workers, data systems and surveillance, helping to strengthen primary health care, all this is very important for our ultimate goal. So when a community gets access to immunization, it also brings with it improved access to nutritional supplements, malaria prevention, dewarming, maternal care, and much more. And critically, in the process, this helps to improve our global early warning system by creating better infectious disease surveillance. But there is still significant work to be done. And this has only been made more difficult because of COVID-19. WHO and UNICEF estimate that the number of zero dose children increased in 2020 by 3.7 million, the majority living in underserved marginalized communities. So as we look to 2022, the priority has to be redoubling our efforts to make up this lost ground and build back better by leveraging routine immunization for a more comprehensive and equitable primary health care. This will bring us closer to achieving universal health care and strengthens the resilience of people and society as a whole. Therefore, we must continue to work together 
globally towards universal health care. The rapid spread of the virus and its continuing impact on our daily lives is a reminder that we are all in this together and no one is safe until we are all protected. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. I hope that was clear for everyone. And um, we thank you to Jose Manuel Barroso as well for providing that. I think the figure that stood out for me in all of that and really encapsulates why UHC and the HEAL campaign is so important is the fact that 8 billion doses of the vaccine have, have gone out and have been administered. And yet there's just so little uptake and, well, and, and provision of it in um, many low and middle income countries around the world. So vaccine inequity, um, of course, is a huge topic at the moment and one that we'll continue to campaign on and one that I know many others across the sector are, are doing their best to, to combat as well. So thank you so much to Jose Manuel Barroso. Um, we've heard now from um, Sonia and Sister April, health workers who have been working um, both nationally and internationally during the pandemic, during the coup, um, to provide key support to patients, to families, um, to loved ones throughout the pandemic and, and other challenges that they've faced. And I think it's really demonstrated the commitment that so many health workers have um, around the world to their roles and to the right to health provision. Then hearing from Jose Manuel Barroso about vaccine inequity and the need to build back better, it's key here that we, we tackle UHC together. Um, and so I think this morning's opened um, on some very serious but important messages. I'm now delighted to um, welcome Action for Global Health, who are going to talk to another extremely serious topic um, in global health at the moment, which is the climate crisis. And I'm really pleased that they'll be talking through their latest campaign. Um, which has been moving to bring awareness to the climate crisis and the effect that it's having on global health. So I'm really pleased to introduce Katie Hustleby and Melissa Jones, both joining from Action for Global Health, who are going to take us through this next part of the morning. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks, Charlotte. And um, thanks also to Ben, uh, Sister April, Sonia, Jose, for all of those fantastic presentations and for really kicking off this morning. Um, I'm delighted to be here with you all this morning. As Charlotte said, my name is Katie Hustleby. I'm the coordinator at Action for Global Health. I'd like to start just by thanking our fantastic co-hosts, Thet, and uh, Students for Global Health um, for joining with us um, on this event to celebrate Universal Health Coverage Day and really highlight the importance of uh, individual activism and campaigning to make progress on the right to good health all around the world. Um, as Ben said, you know, it's been a challenging year and we've seen both the direct and indirect health impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic uh, worsen and also the way in which it has uh, exacerbated and worsened health inequalities. And so there's really never been a more important time to be having these conversations. I'm really looking forward to hearing from a whole range of brilliant speakers this morning on the actions and issues that we need to be focusing on and mobilizing uh, governments to take action to ensure health equity for all. I'm going to start just by giving a very brief introduction of Action for Global Health, who we are, what we do, before handing over to my colleague, Melissa. So just briefly, uh, Action for Global Health is a UK-based network of more than 50 uh, global health organisations working together to achieve health for all. And you'll see our, the logos of our members uh, up on the screen now. Um, we have a range of organisations, uh, international NGOs, uh, smaller and medium-sized charities, uh, research institutions, think tanks, development consultancies. And we really collaborate and join together to uh, mobilize public support, uh, develop policy papers and positions on relevant global health issues, and particularly advocate to the UK government uh, to strengthen its political, financial and programmatic commitments to global health. Uh, ben mentioned earlier our, our climate paper and over the past few weeks, over the past few years, we've really increasingly recognized the importance of climate change as a health issue that we need to be working on. And particularly given the UK's hosting of the Global Climate Summit or COP26 uh, earlier this year, we felt that this was a really important moment to come together as a health network and talk about the intersections between climate change and global health. 
So I'm now going to hand you over to my colleague, Melissa, who's going to talk about our Healthy Futures campaign uh, and why we think we need to focus on climate change in order to achieve universal health coverage. Melissa, over to you. Thank you so much, Katie. And yes, hello, good morning, everybody. It's so lovely to be here with you all. Uh, my name is Melissa Jones and I am the Digital Comms and Campaigns Officer for Action for Global Health. And, and yeah, I'm, today I'm gonna be talking a little bit more about our Healthy Futures um, campaign, which we've been running for the last year or two, and been focusing on um, several different issues, it, you know, in, in particular, um, campaigning around the G7 summit, um, and also campaigning more recently about um, climate change. So I'm going to be focusing more on the climate change work that we've been doing recently around COP26, talk to you a little bit more about what Healthy Futures is about, and how um, how we're working together to basically advocate for health for, for health for all with this movement and uh, yeah how you can join and uh, join us on with um, on the cause and uh, and yeah find out a little bit more about it So why we fight for healthy futures, um, we, we consider like healthy futures is a way of bringing people together um, to form a movement um, to be able to advocate for health for all. And why we actually help and why we actually fight for healthy futures is we believe that no matter who we are or where we live, everybody is the, deserves the right to good health um, everybody deserves the right um, to have access to healthcare whether it's having access to essential healthcare seeing a doctor when you have concerns or getting covid-19 um, getting your covid-19 vaccine everyone has the fundamental right to um, to a healthy future no matter um, where you're where you are what your financial situations are we all have that um, fundamental human right um, but unfortunately, for half of the world's population who lack access to essential healthcare services, um, this simply isn't a reality, um, which is why the likes of the Healthy Future movement has been born. Um, every year, 100 million people are pushed into extreme poverty due to healthcare costs, which, uh, you know, those within the UK, you know, is difficult um, for us to imagine, especially as we're so fortunate to have um, our NHS. But the reality is that people are pushed into extreme poverty because of healthcare costs. Um, and especially with the UK, especially with the COVID-19 pandemic worsening inequalities um, between those who have access to healthcare and those who don't. Um, the impacts of climate change in particular, um, such as rising sea levels, droughts, and heat waves also continue to harm people's health. Um, as we see the devastating effects of our changing climate on communities all over the world, which, as Katie mentioned before, a little bit more about um, our climate change report, I'm going to touch on some of the ways that um, we're making those linkages between climate change and the effects that it's having on people's health. Um, but I'll be talking a little bit more about the campaign and how we're kind of um, educating the public and spreading awareness and raising brand awareness and getting people on board with the movement because it absolutely doesn't have to be this way. Next slide, please. Great. Uh, so yes, I wanted to talk a little bit more about our focus here on the client, our recent climate change report. Um, and quite simply that we're finding, um, you know, particularly more widely that um, outside of the healthcare sector is that people haven't quite understood the connections between climate change and the effects that it's having on people's health, which is why the whole campaign was born. Um, climate change is quite frankly a health emergency. Um, and part of our campaign has been getting people, driving people to our um, website so that they can find more information through our content series, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a second, um, but also like getting people to sign up so that in future campaigns, we're able to affect those changes, we're able to talk to members of parliament, we're able to get those pledges signed um, so that we're actually able to, um, to focus on making those changes um, and putting pressure on those that are, are able to make those changes so we have got access to healthcare to mitigate the effects of climate change on health. Uh, we recently did uh, the campaign, including the, the content series, as I said, in the lead up to COP26. We also attended um, COP26. My colleague and I, um, our advoc uh, advocacy officer, um, Melanie, 
and I, we did, we had a stand at COP26 where we were promoting um, the campaign and getting people to sign up to the movement um, and also, um, um, also promoting our climate change report as well. Uh, we did like a variation of ads. Maybe you have seen them, maybe you haven't. Um, we did advertising with the Metro and the Guardian um, and also the Huffington Post, as well as like advertising across Facebook and, and Twitter in particular. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I'll, um, I'll, I'll go on and I'll um, talk a little bit more if you haven't seen those, talk a little bit more about the campaign. So um, how is climate change impacting our health? Um, quite simply, um, the, there's a myriad of different ways that climate change is affecting um, our health. Um, some, some you may have come across, um, uh, some that you, you might not have. This particular um, diagram is fantastic. This has been taken from our climate change report which you can find more if you want to have a read through is on our Action for Global Health website. Um, but this particular uh, this particular graph is a fantastic way of showing it's a really simplified form of showing what actually is causing climate change. So carbon emissions, you know, the food and agriculture um, industries, energy interest industries, the motorized transport what those climate impacts then are as a result of that. So things like wildfire, increased rainfall, storms, droughts, um, heat waves, extreme events just in general, all of these different um, impacts. And then we're linking to each one of the health impacts that each one of these climates, um, climate change impacts are having on our health. So for instance, wildfires are having respiratory, um, is increasing the risk of respiratory conditions, as well as injuries and general disabilities. Droughts are causing crop failures, food insecurities, and like malnutrition. Um, chronic, uh, chronic kidney disease, rising sea levels is also causing COP failure, um, heat waves ca um, causing cardiovascular diseases, like there's a whole host of different things, but you can actually see from this graph, like exactly each, each individual health impact and where it's actually started from. So starting from what is causing it, what is happening and, you know, the direct effect that it's having um, on our health which is why we wanted um, to raise more awareness through the climate change campaign, through Healthy Futures and what we can do to help. Next slide, please. So as part of our climate change um, campaign, uh, we wanted to raise more awareness and also do kind of more education work with the public um, and just kind of, yeah, raise more awareness about some of these links, because even for ourselves, you know, Action for Global Health, you know, we've um, we've championed for a very long time about um, how important um, foreign aid is and universal health coverage and about, you know, the um, our fundamental right to have access to healthcare. Um, but particularly with COVID exasperating um, the issues that um, healthcare systems are having, as well as then you add climate in, we really are in the middle of like a health emergency. So we really wanted to kind of get back down to basics and talk about um, some of these issues in our climate change content series, which you'll find on healthyfutures.uk. I'll be showing you the link a little bit later on. So through this content series, we kind of were breaking down some of these main issues into, um, into kind of like a way that was more accessible for wider audiences, not just people that are within healthcare. This is an issue that we all face, that everybody should be aware about. And we wanted to make it so that people felt comfortable to join the movement and be able to be part of something without feeling that they they didn't want to join because they didn't have the full information or because they um, they were unaware or they weren't they didn't feel completely informed. So we wanted to go about changing that. And we did a series of different articles, which you can see here. And I'm going to talk about a bit more next in the next slide. Uh, so uh, one of our, uh, we did three main blog posts with a further blog post to be joined um, into our content series about the outcomes of COP26 and what that actually means for the future of healthcare systems on our own health in general. Um, but we did um, we did a selection of three um, to begin with um, over the course of COP26. We did three ways that climate change is impacting our health and what you can do to help in the public. So we just focused on like th the three main issues um, that uh, particularly we worked with partners on as well, um, which is malnutrition. So I was saying before about um, heat waves um, causing, you know, droughts. 
um, and that leads to kind of crop failures and food securities and food systems like falling through. So uh, we talk about the impacts of their malnutrition and then malnutrition and how that affects people's health and exasperates underlying health conditions um, as well. Non-communicable non diseases which can get you a bit tongue-tied. Um, and non-communicable non diseases um, are the kind of diseases that you can't pass on from person to person. So it's things like, um, you know, like health, dis um, heart disease and things like that. Um, and also our mental health. Um, it's the mental health of those that are directly impacted by climate change. So it's things like, you know, people, if there's been uh, mad flooding and people have lost their homes, it's the stress of losing their livelihoods, maybe losing loved ones. And then also the fact that if they have been hurt or affected by climate change, um, and if that has affected those main things in their lives, it's the stress of how are we going to make an income? Where are we going to live? You know, we've lost everything um, through these um, through this extreme, the, these extreme storms and things. Um, it's the mental health of those people that are directly affected, uh, but also more generally, um, particularly for, um, for, uh, for those that aren't, you know, haven't suffered like the more severe um, aspects of climate change. It's the, it's the mental health issues of, it's the anxieties, quite frankly, and the anxieties of, you know, what climate change is doing to our, our planet. Anybody that has been like looking at the, the headlines from COP26 and a lot of the work that, you know, advocates like Greta are doing um, and highlighting is that, you know, particularly with for young people, it's that kind of stress of what kind of, what planet are we leaving for our children and what is gonna be, it's an uncertain future of how, um, how, how we stop climate change, how we mitigate those already those impacts that are already in place as well it's also that kind of mental health um, aspect that is affecting people more generally around the world too especially young people uh, we also did um, an introduction to COP26 so um, for anyone that was unfamiliar with COP26 we wanted to get down to basics and just say okay right we're gonna do short form answers for everything, uh, a whistle stop tour of everything you need to do about, uh, everything you need to know about COP26. So what uh, what is COP? Uh, why was COP created? Why is COP so important? Why does that have an impact um, on health, people meeting up about climate? And also what you can do to help by joining um, the movement. And then our third blog post, um, top recommendations um, for reducing the impact of climate change on our health. Um, we're a very positive movement. Um, I, I think that particularly with um, with the headlines and the way things are progressing and the, there is, and as you'll see from the other speakers, we have got so much work to do and there's so much still left to be done and that we're working towards and we're lobbying for and campaigning for. Um, but overall, we want to make sure that like people are positive and inspired and empowered um, to be able to feel like they can make an impact in changing the future of climate change um, impacting our health. So we talk a lot about in this article of how people can be empowered. So like how we can build stronger health systems around the world, how we can move towards renewable energy, promoting healthy and sustainable diets that are, that don't rely as heavily on uh, the meat and dairy industry, um, renew, um, renewing our commitments to the Paris Agreement, which was agreed um, at the last COP, which was all, talking all about how we reduce climate change and how we how nations were coming together to ensure that the temperature wasn't rising in order to exasperate a lot of these effects on our health. So um, please do go check it out, um, healthyfutures.org, um, healthy futures.uk um, and as I said we'll be adding um, another one to the series um, in due course about the outcomes of COP26 for those that kind of want to see at the end and what we're going to be doing in the future as well as part of the Healthy Futures movement. Next slide please. Um, also, you find on your website, um, for anyone that is new to the movement or um, is still kind of like just um, just in the kind of information stage of, you know, wanting to learn more about, about universal health coverage, about um, the issues we're having with um, people gaining access to healthcare, um, and a lot of the healthcare um, stories that we've got on our website, you know, are very inspirational, very informative. Um, we've got stories from the front line of those that are... Um, that are really right there, all different countries all over the world um, in varying positions, whether it be um, lecturers
focus on health or doctors or nurses, um, you know, real life experiences. Um, Gabriella's story in particular is very hard hitting, um, which is the top on the third, um, which she shows you the realities of those that don't have health care and the impacts. She's seeing the, these real casualties of those that are the most marginalized by health systems. Um, really interesting. Um, if you just want to have a little, um, you know, have a little look around, this goes into a bit, these stories go into a little bit more detail of um, universal health coverage and, you know, as some of the issues that we're talking about today um, with vaccinations um, and, and equity and things like that. Um, you'll also find just generally some resources as well. If you go down to the bottom of the website, you'll find things on talk where we're talking about universal health coverage, what we're doing for the future, and yeah, just just more information as well as um, real life human stories, um, which has been a pleasure um, to work on. So just for a bit more information um, um, outside of our climate, our focus on climate change for healthy futures, if you want a bit more information. Next slide, please. So uh, we'd love you to come join us, um, you know, through Healthy Futures, we hope to unite campaigners um, just like you um, to call on the UK government to achieve um, to achieve our goal of health for all. So, you know, essentially the equal access to healthcare when people need it. Um, this is an era, we see this as an era as not business as usual. We all have our part to play. You know, it's not just um, organizations within like, you know, the health sector or the charitable sector. You know, we all need to show up and with campaigners and advocates support, we're able to actually affect those changes by creating enough of a buzz that word does get to those that are able to make those changes in the world. So that's what we're, the whole campaign is about. And uh, we would love you to join us. And there is the website, yeah. And we've also got a little bit more detail here um, on um, our social media channels. So um, Action for Global Health Network on um, Twitter, you'll find us, and also on um, Facebook, um, Action for Global Health. Thank you so much. Thanks so much um, to Melissa and, and Katie. Thank you so much, both of you, for joining us and for hosting um, today's um, meeting with us. Um, that is a, a phenomenal campaign and one that I really hope everybody goes away today and looks um, for online and joins in. And I know there's much more to come and Melissa was um, hinting at some of the exciting things still coming, but I know there are some more exciting things that haven't been hinted at. Um, so do keep a lookout for it, do follow. Um, on social media and, and sign up to newsletters and things because the work that Action for Global Health and the Healthy Futures campaign is critical to us all coming together um, as networks, as organisations and as individuals um, in this new year of the UHC. So thank you so much, Katie and Melissa. Absolutely. Pleasure. Um, I'm now delighted to hand over to our other co-host um, for this morning, Students for Global Health, and welcome Katie Cowie, who's also joined by um, Hamimi Masudi from Health Poverty Action, um, who is co-chair of the Track Changing Initiative, um, which also falls under the Kampala Initiative, which is a really crucial um, movement at the moment to decolonize global health, to change the language that we're using, to change our approaches, the way that we think about how we work across the sector and to influence um, you know, key stakeholders and governments as well in the process. So, I'm delighted to hand over to Katie and Hanimu now. Thank you both so much for joining us. Hi, all lovely to meet everyone. Um, I'm just trying to share our PowerPoint uh, slides, so just give us a second um, and we'll get all that sorted. Brilliant. It's lovely to see everyone this morning. Um, all the speakers this morning have been fantastic um, and I'm really glad to be here. Um, so as I said, um, my name is Katie Cowie um, and I'm representing Students for Global Health, which is a student-led organisation whose aim is to create a network of students empowered to um, affect tangible social and political change. Um, on a local, national and international level, through education, through advocacy and community action. Our vision is very clear. We want a fair and just world in which equity, for, equity to health is a reality for all. 
Um, we are a large network. Um, we have about 28 branches so far across the country in um, lots of different universities and medical schools. Um, we have 13 national affiliate organizations and our partners such as SFG, uh, AFGH. Sorry. Um, aside from our branches and affiliates, um, we are made up of our national committee, which heads up the organization as to which I'm a part of, our board of trustees and patrons, including Sir Michael Marmot and Dorcas Gatwa, uh, among, uh, among others. Aside, um, my role within the organization is as a policy and advocacy director. And as part of that role, I run the coordinated theme, which governs the advocacy and education work we do uh, for this year. So for 2021 to 2022, we chose to focus our efforts on race and health. We felt that after the Black Lives Matter protests of 2020 and the unequal impacts of COVID-19 on ethnic minorities in the UK and around the world, this issue needs to be addressed fully. We understand that the UK is not immune from racial bias, um, but that perhaps the youth can change the narrative and promote a culture of acceptance. To tackle these issues, um, we will be focusing on our two streams of work, uh, firstly, access to health for ethnic minorities um, um, and the impact of race on, um, on that and the access to healthcare. And also racism in medical schools um, and the NHS in relation to the workforce and equal opportunities. This will hopefully culminate in a long term race and health report card, which will um, look at curriculum workforce in our universities, um, addressing racial discrimination and racial bias. However, today we will be looking global at the impact of racism and on health and the impact of that on our universal health coverage by addressing decolonizing global health. And I'm delighted to introduce Hamu Masudu from Health Poverty Action. Um, Hamu is an Ugandan communication professional, po policy analyst, and a social mobilizer. He has over 15 years track record in designing and implementing social justice. Um, that cultivate national, regional and international grounds well of support in Africa. Um, and also he's had various positions in the media. Um, he's currently policy and campaigns officer um, Health Poverty Action and co-chair of Track Changing Work Group of the Kampala Initiative on Beyond Aid and Decolonization of Global Health. Um, thank you very much, Hamouf, and I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Katie, for that introduction. I am extremely very excited to be part of this uh, conversation. Like Katie has told you, I am talking to you from Kampala, Uganda. And um, I am putting on uh, these big earphones, and uh, not because I fly airplanes, no, it's because I just want to make sure I don't miss out on any communication that comes from you and also making sure that I speak to you. So as uh, Kate has said, my theme this morning is gonna be decolonizing global health and reaching universal health coverage. Next slide, please. Yes, yeah, so I'll start by saying a few things about uh, uh, the two organizations. I think uh, the Kampala Initiative has been well uh, told to you by, by Katie, but uh, I also work with the, my main organization where I work is Health Poverty Action. And we work to challenge the structures and systems that keep people uh, in poverty and hold those responsible for it to account. So, we work alongside ignored communities, okay? Those ones are the age, like indigenous communities. And uh, we refuse, those who refuse to accept that, um, uh, you know, injustice that deny people health, you know. For example, in Guatemala, we work with indigenous communities to make sure that they access, you know, facilities in um, uh, health facilities. In the UK, we work with uh, different actors and we try to highlight how the legacy of colonialism has caused the devastation of global health and inequalities that we see today. We belong to very many uh, movements, but prominent 
of them are the ones that uh, decolonize health, the one for Kampala Initiative. Then we also um, belong to one that tries to uh, decolonize the fight against um, drug policy. We also belong to movements that um, try to re-educate and decolonize our education systems. Finally, we also work to decolonize language. We think that the language that we currently use in, um, in our discourse is damaging and needs to change. So I'll, the, I'll go straight to my presentation and uh, define very quickly, uh, as you can see on, this, on your screens, I'll be talking about coloniality which is the living legacy of colonialism in contemporary societies in the form of social, economic, and political domination that outlived former colonialism and became integrated in the succeeding social order. Next slide, please. Then the, key, the other key uh, terminology will be decolonization. Probably someone has defined it, but for my presentation, decolonization is the process of deconstructing colonial ideologies, superiority and privilege of Western thought and approaches. Therefore, decolonization of aid means interrogating the processes, the structures and matrix of power within the aid industry so that we can push back uh, elements of racism, patriarchy, misogyny and exploitation and also white supremacy. Next slide, please. I'll also be talking about development assistance uh, for health. And we define it as the official development assistance eh, for health sectors that the global north sends to global south. This includes both grants and concessional loans provided by governments, multilateral institutions, and other official agencies. I will not uh, dwell on donations by private individuals and foundations for reasons that some of them uh, probably could be uh, targeted. Eh? They are charities and probably they are, they are well-meaning, though also they also have issues. So I'll not pay attention to that. Then universal health coverage, I think that one is well known. I won't go into its definition. Next slide, please. Yeah, so I'll start by looking at the financial models of universal health coverage and uh, um, as probably you are aware, at least half of the world's population does not have full coverage of essential health services. And each year about 100 million are pushed into extreme poverty because they have to pay for health. You know, the majority of these are located in the global, in the so-called global south. And uh, what makes up global south is that these are former colonies. Okay, the global north, those are former colonial masters. So I want to underline that because it's going to be part of most, it's going to underline part of my, most of my, my presentation. So paying for health, universal health coverage is not just about being able to access health. It is also about being able to pay or to afford. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So the question is who pays for healthcare? I think in the global north, in countries like the UK, it probably is understood. You have a system that enables you to access self and that probably comes from the taxpayer's money and that is the government. But uh, there are three main that we deal with in the global south. Some, one of them is the out of pocket, okay? Then the other is the private insurance and then also the government. Next slide. Next slide, please. Yes, so in the global south, the problem with the government um, as a source of funding for universal health coverage is that um, it is entangled with the legacies of colonialism and weaknesses of coloniality. So the problem with that is Yeah, sorry, okay, cool. The problem with that is it's, it, it's the control it has over policies of small and fragile countries. And this power is, expre is expressed in the manner in which it is channeled, 
what it does, for whom, and how long. Those are key areas eh, of, of DA, and that's where we have problems with them. So this model of financing of healthcare, you know, is blamed and it drafts, you know, local capacities and agencies. It treats communities like they are not uh, capable of getting themselves up to the traps they are in. They are just supposed to open their hands and wait for aid to drop into their hands. So it undermines the building of strong health systems and creates inactive society which of course uh, we, we, we say that is suspicious and we think that probably that one is a continuation of what? The system of colonialism, extracting resources from these weak countries. Next slide, please. Yeah, so the Western aid industry has perpetually failed to recognize the historical contribution of European colonialism on the current socioeconomic challenges in the global South such as uh, you know, Sub-Saharan Africa and a country like mine here in Uganda, which of course propagates the use of aid as a form of Western benevolence to the people of Africa, rather than an obligation to the damages, rather than looking at health as a, as a public good, as a right, it's looked at as aid, you know? Next slide. So I have just this quote eh, that came from one of our recent interviews, uh, researches. It says that aid has an invisible power over its recipients. And this power is inconspicuous that recipients don't necessarily understand how it plays. For instance, aid often dictates solutions based on Western models of influence from global North academia. The voices of communities or even local experts and, sectors and, and sector leaders are not often listened to. Okay, so when aid takes decisions to choose which health issues to focus on, communities to intervene in, vulnerable people to uplift and geographical areas to invest in, this power asymmetry creates contradictions and hierarchies which are detrimental to the health of communities uh, across the world. Next slide, please. Although uh, DA, that is the uh, assistance for health, is, um, you know, uh, and its structures like the Global Health Initiative adequately articulate the need to, to strengthen in country health systems as more sustainable approach to improve the quality of lives of the most um, under uh, served population, their scope, the way they approach things, is not good, you know. I have this mission of Gavi to increase effectiveness and efficacy of, of immunization delivery as an integrated part of strengthening health system. But none of this mentions one of the critical things of strengthening in-country health systems, the pharmaceutical capacity to deliver the most critical products within this portfolio. These ones are always ignored. And you can make reference to the current standoff we're having on, um, on people's vaccine. It's the pharmaceutical industries at the center of it all. We don't have these in countries like Uganda. And yet these ones are critical in global health. So health systems um, uh, uh, that are weak cannot you know, deliver universal health uh, coverage. That's the, the underlying uh, our message. And uh, we think that this is done deliberately uh, because of the incentives, economic incentives that uh, probably benefit the people who give aid. Next slide, please. I'll talk briefly about the uh, private public partnerships, which is one of the models eh, of financing health. And um, so most recently, ODA in general has experimented the PP's models eh, of financing in fragile states. The model works for donor agencies facilitating private firms, mostly Western based, to sign partnerships with government to take development programs. In some arrangements, the development agencies have played a much critical role in the selection of private companies. That's uh, an issue that it's, it, it means they're bypassing the 
agencies. So it's, uh, I'll not go through this, but uh, next slide, please. I'll just go to the point I'm trying to make about the PPPs. So the problem with PPPs is that they have also, there are, there are reports of extravagant expenditures by foreign companies. Eh? There are tax avoidances, intentional project delays, tendencies to overstretch the contracts, there are incidents of, of overpricing, influence peddling, outright state official incompetence of, and, and foreign compromises of the local state. So these are challenges of PPS. Eh? From the outlook, from what we hear in the media, they look good, flowery, very benevolent, helpful to the people. But this is what communities experience. Okay, so how are we going to achieve universal health, health coverage if we have uh, these kinds of, of situations, eh? when we have um, uh, models like this? So this, uh, to, 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 to us, when you're talking about universal, universal health coverage and you have this type of financing, then you are creating a contradiction. You're creating a situation where the people who need health most will not access it because universal health coverage is about affordability. It's about having income. It's about creating a situation where people can access health without using their out of pocket uh, savings, which in most cases pushes down, down further the spiral of poverty. So finally, about the PPS, they are centered in capitalism, okay? They expand globalization and create a market opportunity for Western corporations that have continued to monopolize developing countries' uh, markets. They weaken local industrialization efforts and they cause subsequent dumping of foreign products like medical products in developing countries. Next slide, please. Next, I'll talk about market fundamentalism. I won't spend a lot of it, but I'll just, uh, because I'm, I'm sure most of you know about this, but I look at the problem of, of it. But market fundamentalism is about to, um, the notion that people acting in their own interest in a free market is the best way to organize society. So because of this focus on individualism and prior, uh, pr prioritization of the market over the state, market fundamentalism ideology leads to an economic model that combines privatization, fiscal austerity measures, deregularization, free trade, reduction in government spending, you know, it just takes away the role of the state in taking care of its people. Market fundamentalism has been the dominant form of economic organization in numerous countries in the global south for over 40 years. You can imagine. Next slide, please. So uh, the IMF and uh, the World Bank are behind this. They have done what we, you probably have heard about the structural adjustment programs in countries where they have uh, conditioned our governments in the global south to stop spending on health and, 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 and pass this responsibility to the private sector. And so the private sector given loans to do this. But we are saying that this is not cool. This um, is, 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 is killing people. It is taking away the role of the state to provide for its citizens. You cannot give the role, the lives of people to be managed by entities whose bottom line is profits. I think in situations where they've got to judge between your death probably and making a profit, I think there's going to be a, a situation where they are going to deliberate. And we don't want someone to deliberate about these things. We want someone to be definite and say, no, this is my right. Rather, this is my, my duty and I've got to protect the people. So the IMF have, have done damage. They tried to end this, okay, a while ago, but the legacies have remained and they continue to promote similar policies. Eh? You know, sometimes in the form of technical advice to countries, bilateral and multilateral aid projects. They encourage privatization and opening up of economies, foreign investment and competitiveness. So I, I thought we needed also to look at this market 
which we, we pay attention to at Health Poverty Action, it is at the core of people's poverty and also poor health because all the resources that are supposed to be used to provide health to people are being taken away in forms of repaying the debts and servicing loans and doing all sorts of things. So there is a problem for us with market fundamentalism. Next slide, please. So market fundamentalism has provided bad, uh, has proved to be bad for health in three main ways. It has driven poor economic performance and increased poverty in the global South, uh, leading to an increase in poor health. It has driven cuts in public spending and increased privatization impacting on the provision of health services. It has propelled inequalities resulting in poor people for the most impoverished. In addition to free trade agreements, they have also you know, uh, done what we are struggling with, the patents, the trips, eh? you know? So market fundamentalism has generated a mantra which uh, says that an individual's lifestyle is the cause of poverty, okay? So deflecting the attention from the political and economic uh, social causes. Next slide, please. You can see I'm running out of time. So how do we decolonize global health? I'll, I'll not run through this, but um, I'll just say that uh, we need to take away the power of providing health services from the market and give it back to the governments. Next slide. Next slide. Yes, so I'll end with this slide of decolonizing global uh, uh, health, eh? a step towards reaching. So uh, we, we need to move beyond the aid narrative. That is at the core of my message. Eh? We cannot stop aid, okay? Aid has got to keep coming to, to save lives, but we need good aid, good aid that does not create situations of bad health. So one of the issues that we are, we are struggling with is the language of aid, which is damaging. It creates a narrative of people living in poverty in the global South as helpless without agency. I've said this one. So people are just waiting to be served by a good person from somewhere else. That is not good for health. So we want to change first the name of aid. It should be called something different. Next slide. I have this uh, graphic, and I think this explains the whole relationship between countries in the South and countries in the North. So the rest of the world extracts six times the resources from countries eh, in Africa than what it gives through the so-called aid. And the reasons, are, the, the explanations I've given are here. So we have tax avoidance, illegal resource you know, uh, extractions, we, we know debt repayment and all sorts of things. But when you look at what is got from Africa, it is six times more than what it, it, it receives in aid. So why do we call this aid? It should be something else. It could be compensation. It could be an equalization fund. It could be a reparation. It could be an, any other thing, but not aid. If we can change the name of aid, we will be able to mobilize differently. Our politics will change. We'll start doing things differently trying to serve communities based on health as a right, not health as aid. Next slide, and I think final. Yeah, so it's time to rename aid. I wanted to end with this. We need to rename this uh, animal called aid because it is at the core of our universal health coverage, more so in countries that are fragile in nature, like my country here in Uganda, where we depend on aid almost 93% uh, of the time. And uh, this is unreliable, okay? Given the history of these countries in the South and those ones that give aid, I think this is not right to call this aid. It should be something different. It should be an equalization fund. It, it should be um, a reparation. It could be something different, but what is at the core of changing the name for us is that it helps us in mobilizing effectively and appropriately. So thank you very much. I'll stop here and uh, hope 
that you'll have access to my presentation and see some of the things that I couldn't have time to explain. Thank you very much, uh, Katie. Thank you very much, Homo. That was um, really, really interesting. Um, I just have one, a few questions if I ha we have time. I'm sh I know Charlotte's probably looking at me, we're probably running over. Um, but I'll just ask one question. Um, first off, I thought it was really interesting that you said, um, you talked about how people are expecting that aid. I think it was interesting how people maybe are sitting back. Is this a question also about taking personal responsibility for health, not just the government's taking responsibility, but individuals maybe within the, those countries saying, you know, I want to be served by my government. I want to, you know, be, uh, I want to take control of this rather than letting the responsibility fall on either aid workers or foreign governments who are not, in our case, you know, they're not always reliable, as you've obviously pointed out. Um, so what do you think about that? Thanks a lot for that wonderful question. And it's at the core of my presentation. So uh, the approach here is that uh, you're dealing with communities that have undergone, um, uh, you know, some form of, uh, I'm looking for the right word, but they have been exploited. So colonialism took a period of over 100 years. These communities internalized, first of all, that they are not good enough. They're self-stigmatizing themselves. They're looking down upon themselves. They are being told their systems were destroyed and dismantled. The ones they used to use to provide health. They were dismantled. They were told these are primitive. This is wrong. You cannot, you know, the Christian missionaries came very well and replaced these ones with health uh, centers which are built on aid. So communities, generation over generation, have grown up and they are still looking outside for help. But when we have aid and the way it is being named, the language of aid, it is so disempowering. It continues the legacy of aid. People still believe that they need to still continue to debate, to depend rather on, on someone's goodwill elsewhere. It does not give it does not empower people to start looking at themselves as change agents. That is one. The second one is that this system is still continuing. There's a legacy. Like I have said, we have uh, debt repayments. We have someone, I mean, my pre the previous speaker talked about climate change. Countries in the global South don't contribute to climate change. But if you talk to a Maasai, one of the nomadic pastors here in, in, rather in East Africa, they are suffering climate change impacts, droughts, their cattle are dying, everything. Okay, so, and they didn't contribute to this climate change. They don't do anything to this global warming that you're talking about, yes, but they're suffering this. So how do, we, how do we expect this Maasai nomadic pastors to get themselves good health out of this whole scenario? That is one, one answer, one part of the answer. The final answer to read, is that um, uh, communities, these true communities need to look at themselves. Uh, the personal determinants eh, of health, they need to focus on that. But at the same time, like we always focus at Kampala Initiative and Health Poverty Action, we say that there are social determinants of health that need to be addressed if people are going to be freed out of the trap of poor health and poverty. Amazing. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'll hand back to Charlotte. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Katie and Hamimu. I, as, as we can see, we, we should be talking about this for, for hours longer. And I really hope that the work that you're doing, Hamimu, and the work that Katie and others are doing across the sector really does um, have that impact. And people do spend hours, days, weeks, years have a long we need to be actioning um, the really crucial points that you've made this morning. So I'm only sorry that we don't have more time to, to continue on such an important conversation, but thank you so much for your leadership in this area. And I can see from the comments that many, many of our um, attendees and panelists will be reaching out to you to, to further this important work. So thank you so much to Mimu and Katie. Um, we've come to the end of the first section of the morning, and um, I know that we will take a short break now, but I just wanted to thank everybody for their contributions so far. We've heard, um, we've, we've moved through from the debt and the um, positions that health workers put themselves in, um, from Myanmar to the UK to Zambia, 
through to vaccine inequity with Jose Manuel Barroso's contributions, and then covered two increasingly important issues um, in the global health sector from the climate crisis to de decolonizing global health and the structures that are pervasive around us. So I want to thank all of our speakers this morning so far. Um, I'd like to take a five minute break now so everyone can run away and get a cup of tea and take a minute away from the screen before we return and to a roundtable chaired by Rupa Dutt, who is the Executive Director of Women in Global Health. And in that roundtable, we will hear from speakers from the NHS, from Sierra Leone, from Nepal, and also from the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine, um, with talks ranging from health system gaps and inequities, experience of diaspora, and gender equity. So I do hope you'll join us in back um, here in five minutes, and we'll begin again promptly at 11.07. Thank you so much to all our speakers so far. Welcome back, everyone. I hope that everyone's managed to run off and grab a cup of tea and rest their eyes from the screens um, after this morning's presentation so far. I'm now delighted to hand over to, to Rupa Dat, who is, as I said, the Executive Director and Founder of Women in Global Health, um, a pioneering organisation which has really taken over um, many parts of the world now and is, uh, and is leading through local chapters um, with our very own in the UK and many from countries um, of the attendees that are joining today. So 
Rupa, I'm thrilled to hand over to you. Thank you for leading us through this next roundtable discussion. Great, thank you, Charlotte. Thank you, Charlotte, um, for the introduction. And it is really wonderful to be here with all of you um, on, the, on the eve of, of the official Universal Health Coverage Day to really kick off this session, Postcards from an Unequal World, and a special acknowledgement to the Tropical Health and Education Trust, Action for Global Health, and Students for Global Health for really putting this conversation together. Uh, I am the Executive Director of Women in Global Health, and so I wanted to set the scene a bit um, as we open this roundtable with uh, esteemed uh, speakers from all around the world, and they'll be sharing their perspectives on universal coverage and how do we really get to this uh, vision of having uh, the word universal truly mean universal, truly mean that we don't leave anyone behind and really be equitable driven. Uh, women in global health, uh, for us, particularly um, when we take a look at universal health coverage, it is as much about making sure that uh, not a single person ends up in poverty uh, from accessing health services, but that there's also the access aspect of it and really looking at who's leading you universal coverage, who's delivering universal coverage, and how are um, people accessing universal coverage, and what are the circumstances around all of that, and, and whether all of that is truly uh, in a gender equitable manner. Uh, so when uh, universal coverage um, became a top priority through the sustainable development goals, and it was announced that there's going to be a high level meeting on universal health coverage in 2019, women in global health together with an alliance of over 100 plus organizations really rallied around gender equality because the very first set of documents, the very first political declaration that came from member states in the World Health Organization was completely gender blind. And so for us, um, we uh, continue to champion on this issue of really having gender equality hardwired into universal health coverage. And it means uh, a couple of key things for us. Um, you know, we, we had to champion in 2019. Uh, hopefully many of you have been part of that championing process. Uh, and the political declaration that passed in 2019 is considered one of the strongest when it comes to gender equality, uh, especially in all aspects of health system, including strong language on access to sexually reproductive health services, but also acknowledging the unique role that women as health workers play in the health system being at least 70% um, of the health workforce in most settings and, and most LMIC settings, especially the frontline health workers, 90% um, of them are going to be women. So as we reflect, um, you know, there are a couple of key messages I want to uh, kick us off with. One, universal health coverage is only going to be universal when it reaches everyone. Um, we know that women face multiple multiple barriers to accessing health services, especially um, limited mobility, limited autonomy, loss of money on average um, than meant to buy services. Um, so we do know that universal coverage must uh, be universal. Um, second, health services under universal coverage should be allocated according to the health needs um, and needs to address the distinct needs of women, adolescents, and girls, and which means that um, keeping, uh, ensuring that sexual and reproductive health and rights are part of that. We've seen in the pandemic that this was one area, the, one of the first set of services to be disrupted. And according to a WHO survey, 30, uh, 30 countries that responded on the survey reported a disruption of family services um, and access to maternal neonatal health during the pandemic. Third, universal coverage must be gender responsive and address the gender-based determinants of health. So not just acknowledging that gender um, aspects exist and contribute um, to the experience of uh, people with their health system, but also uh, addressing the root drivers of the gender inequities. And we know men have lower expectancies. They're less likely to engage in the health system uh, in, in certain contexts, um, uh, factoring in mental health differences. So these are all aspects of being gender responsive. Uh, fourth, universal coverage must confront the gender bias and discrimination um, seen in all aspects of health. A classic example is when we take a look at um, drug and vaccine trials. Again, they're often based on men. Um, and then fifth, really acknowledging women are not a monolithic group, but really uh, applying an intersectionality lens. And I'm very sure our panelists today will be talking about that. So looking at race, ethnicity, age, ableism, migrant status, gender identity, sexual orientation, class, 
class cast, um, and all of all of that and much more can impact the access and health outcomes. Six, universal health coverage must address the vulnerabilities of women and girls in humanitarian contexts. We have seen um, and currently uh, playing itself out in many parts of the world. We are seeing fragile states. We're seeing conflict states, and we've, we are seeing disruption of entire health systems. And so really making sure we understand and address and tailor universal coverage for those unique settings. Um, seventh, acknowledging that women are majority of the health workforce, they're the drivers of health, yet health systems are designed for men, by men, led by men. We have a critical shortage of 18 million health workers needed worldwide by 2030. Majority of these will be women, but yet they are don't have decent work. Um, many of them are underpaid, face violence. Um, and, uh, number eight is around really making sure women have leadership roles in health decision making. Um, even in the pandemic, what we've seen is while there's been a strong call for gender equity uh, and a recognition of women uh, leaders that are head of states, when decision making has been taking place in the COVID-19 process, majority of the na uh, national task teams, 85% of them are majority male um, uh, membership. So we know women are being again sidelined. And uh, nine, really making universal coverage policy being informed by sex and gender disaggregated data, also disaggregated this data as much as possible by intersectionality. And finally, when, when we are taking a look at universal health coverage, um, we must really realize that addressing these gender impacts, it's not only uh, the right thing to do, but it's the only way we're gonna really achieve universal health coverage. Um, so on that note, uh, setting the foundation on looking at things from a gender and broader equity lens, I'm really excited to introduce our first um, speaker, Norma, um, and uh, particularly uh, Norma Barbosa is the lead midwife for continuity of, of care and personalization at NHS North Central London Clinic Commission Group. And she also is a Florence Nightingale Foundation Scholar. It's really a privilege to first hear from a woman health worker who is uh, seeing these things play itself out um, in the front line. So the floor is yours, Norma, and I'll turn it to the technical team, Charlotte, um, to, uh, inter uh, to start the video um, if Norma is not able to join live. Hello, good morning everyone. My name is Norma Barbosa and I'm the NCL Lead Midwife for Continuity of Care and Personalization. I'm also a professional midwifery advocate and I'm part of the first cohort of the Mary Seco Development Leadership Program in partnership with the Florence Nightingale Foundation. I have been um, invited today to uh, talk to you about the experiences of uh, the diaspora staff in the NHS. So let me share my screen with you. I'd like to draw your attention to the first slide. These numbers have been taken from the staff overseas report that the House of Commons has recently um, reported uh, in September 2021. Staff coming from overseas actually represent 14.6% of the whole of the NHS workforce. This is actually a very significant number. It means that one in seven colleagues from the NHS come from another country. This can make NHS a very truly a unique place to work. However, my question is, have we all been treated equally. We know that there are endemic inequalities faced by ethnic minority members of staff in the maternity service services. And this has been widely reported. As you can see, there are a few uh, national reports that have uh, discussed this. And we know that more Black, Asian and minority ethnicities members of staff are unsatisfied with the outcome of the workplace investigations when compared with the white staff. We know that colleagues from this background are more likely to be victimized by management than the white colleagues. And we also know that colleagues from these backgrounds are less likely to be praised by management after raising a concern. And we know that colleagues are more likely than white uh, 
members of staff of not raising a concern for fear of victimization. And unfortunately, these numbers are not new. These numbers have actually been reported in 2015. The good, the good thing is we are talking about this now. We are speaking up. We are discussing this. We, have, we are bringing these uh, things to the table and we are making sure that things are now being addressed. So what can we do to change the culture? We have to look at the workforce well-being as a priority. Uh, professional midwifery advocates and most recently now professional nursing advocates have been trained to support colleagues, to support their me mental well-being, to support colleagues to develop their professional and personal resilience. So leaders are now looking at workforce well-being as a priority. Leadership nurtured in everyone and that why, that's why it's so important to support, to encourage colleagues to apply for leadership courses such as the ones that Florence Nightingale offers. These courses can support us to find our voice, to uh, become inclusive, compassionate leaders and support, support others to do the same. It's important that we uh, promote a, cultural, a culture of openness and freedom to speak up to encourage colleagues to raise a concern, to speak up if they see something that it's not right, to engage midwives in, in, in cultural awareness training, to make sure that there are fair opportunities for all, whether it's training, whether it's career development, that everyone is encouraged to apply, everyone is encouraged to, to um, go for a role and especially those that are less likely to engage because historically perhaps they had less opportunities like this. And very important, people have to be managed fairly with respect and with kindness. So as I said, things are now being discussed. We have the Capital Midwife Anti-Racism Framework uh, that has been developed developed based on the recommendations from the reports um, mentioned before and this framework supports trusts to um, tackle inequalities and racism in the workplace. The civility toolkit has also been developed to support colleagues to um, be civil, share civility and tackle incivility at the workplace because we know that incivility has a very negative effect on the workforce, on our colleagues. And we know that uh, this can also have a big impact on the quality of care that we provide to our service users. So everything is linked. And ultimately, if we treat our colleagues with fairness, with kindness, that will be reflected in the quality of care that we provide to the communities that we serve. I would like to just um, finish this short presentation with one of my uh, most favorite uh, quotes from Maya Angelou. I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. So to grow a culture of kindness, it starts with each one of us. So each act of kindness will lead to another act of kindness. And that will have a positive impact in the staff retention, um, staff levels of sickness, and ultimately in the quality of care that we provide to our communities. Thank you very much uh, for uh, giving me the time to uh, share this with you today. Uh, please do email me if um, there is any questions or any topics that you'd like to um, further discuss with me. Have a lovely day. Bye bye. Thank you, Norma, uh, for such a uh, telling presentation and highlighting that there needs to be 
active efforts and intentional efforts to address racial inequality, uh, again, bringing that intersectionality lens forward, um, how we can truly support our health and care workers. And that does include being intentional about addressing workplace, workplace culture and how we can achieve uh, better, uh, greater equity. So we will be coming back to Norma for, for a Q&A section. Uh, I'm excited to next introduce uh, Patrick Lebby, who is a long-term volunteer at Cambridge Global Health Partnerships and a retired stroke specialist. Patrick, to you. Hello. Sorry, good morning to everyone. Uh, first, I will start by introducing myself. My name is Patrick Levy. And uh, there is a picture there which uh, the moderator is uh, putting the slides on. And uh, I am a retired stroke specialist, healthcare professional or nurse. But I've been now a long time uh, support volunteer working for Cambridge Global Health Partnership and the Bo Aki Stroke Unit. I worked in the NHS for 22 years in UK, and my country of birth is Sierra Leone. And I want to give back to that society through the help of friends and benefactors. From 2018, we have shuffled between UK and Sierra Leone in order to establish this stroke unit. And uh, from November 2020, we are training nurses and allied healthcare professionals with stroke competencies for six months. During our facilitation, we covered NIHSS, one way of uh, assessing stroke patients. We raise awareness about risk factors in hypertension that may lead to stroke rehabilitation. So this leads me to today's topic, the outbreak of COVID-19 and the pressure that the nurses we are under. So if you can put on the slide of the map of Sierra Leone, my country place, that will be helpful. Good. That is a little country, Sierra Leone, population of 7.2 million. And where we are presently based or working is in Bo, which is the second largest city in the country. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. Uh, establishing the stroke unit in Sierra Leone. Uh, as you can see, I've already uh, spoken about our little work and uh, what we have been doing or about myself more. But Sierra Leone is rather unfortunate because we haven't got any special unit like a stroke unit in the whole country. And I learned that when I paid a visit back in 2014, I was part of a team that one uh, consultant, cardiology consultant, Dr. Mark, took along and we toured the country and the, I then discovered that there was no stroke specialist unit. Okay, next slide please. Okay, so as I said, our discussion is based on the precious nurses encountered over the past 18 months or going to 20 months or now. Since the outbreak of uh, COVID, due to this outbreak, uh, as we know, our healthcare system structures in Sierra Leone is really, really very, very damn below everything we can say. For 11 years, there was civil war. 1991 to 2002, and there was an Ebola outbreak in 2014, then the more slide in 2017. And as I stated it here, the COVID pandemic was the last straw that broke the camel's back. Nurses, including other healthcare professionals, we are in the forefront of everything or are still in the forefront of managing health system. And uh, the nurses are at the receiving end 
and they are under tremendous pressure in order to administer treatment. And as we all know, the way to do Northern countries, where developed countries, we are even struggling to get PPEs. And how much more do you think about the nurses in developing countries? So the healthcare system in Sierra Leone is pay as you access your care. From the point of entry, if you go with a patient to A and E, you have to buy papers in order to take documentation. You have to pay for anything that is being done for that patient, starting from even the gloves that the nurses are going to be working with. So there is tremendous strain on nurses because if they bring a patient who is bleeding and they ask for relatives to buy gloves and you haven't got this money or you haven't got these gloves yet, you the nurse have to go all out in order to try to improvise before ever you can start to treat your patient. So the areas that we are going to cover today, one was resilience. And under resilience, what I picked up was in Sierra Leone, the Ministry of Health and Sanitation employed about 62% female workforce and 37% are male. But the female voices are hardly listened to. So their role is do as you are told. And they have got very little power in decision making board system. So the other areas that I will talk, which are not on the slide now, uh, the gaps, uh, the opportunities, the reflection and challenges. So as you can see up there, under the gaps, there is a big division between the North and the Southern Hemisphere. So when COVID came out, it was left with the developed world to come to our aid, we in the poorer countries. So PPEs, we are inadequate. Specialist units, we are not, we are in short supply. And specialized trained healthcare professionals, we are hardly around. So, when I was reading through one magazine, and uh, it is uh, the African Medical Research uh, Magazine, that African countries so far have received only 33.7% of vaccines. So which means vaccination in developing countries is one big, big, gap that is making even like as we recently saw the Omicron variant that has come out. And uh, if the South Africans and the other healthcare workers had not picked it up quick, it was going to kill a lot of people out in South Africa and in neighboring countries before ever people have picked it up in the Western world. Opportunities. As the world now is referred to as a global village, there is an opportunity for the well advanced countries to come to the aid of the less developed countries so that when a global pandemic breaks out, will we all start on the plain level field? It is an opportunity for the less developed countries to gear up and train their personnel, buy equipment that they can use in the present day technology world. It is also an opportunity for the voices of nurses to be heard by upgrading their skills that can put them in better position to be listened to as equals when it comes to making decisions in healthcare system, as they are in the forefront in shaping not only our today 
healthcare system, but also managing our tomorrow healthcare system. Reflection. And anything you do, you have to think and you reflect. So I am happy to say that Ted has done us a great favor. Our Bo Akistroke unit applied for funding in order to train nurses. And so the NNCF fellowship, Ted has given us this opportunity. And if at all, properly harness a handful of our colleagues will become future leaders and have a voice in reshaping our May hierarchy dominated healthcare system in Sierra Leone. Challenges. One, lack of training opportunities for nurses to be bridged. There are a lot of nurses who are really intelligent, but some of them are coming from poor background families. And as a result, they do not have the chance to even train, moving from community health trained nurses to state registered trained nurses. Provision of equipment and other resources that can facilitate our working environment. Example, laptops, ECG machines, bladder scanners, to be covered under search fellowship for the benefit of our patients. Last but not the least, helping in setting up a pool of retired experienced nurses to serve as bodies to the upcoming young nursing professionals. And so with our exposure to church, I hope that the partnership will continue and will grow from strength to strength. So thank you very much for paying attention to me. And if I thought there are any questions and answers, feel free to ask me. I'm ready to see, answer you now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick, uh, for reminding us of how we are in a global village and we must go from strength to strength and really driving home that message uh, of we lose out when we do not use the expertise of nurses and especially women nurses. It's great to hear you talk about the gender inequities and more broadly, we need to support all nurses, uh, invest in them, provide them with decent work, um, make sure they have access to personal protective equipment and they get the leadership opportunities. Some of the most recent data that we are seeing is that in many places around the world, at least 20% of our nurses are planning Planning to leave the workforce, given the fact that they are not being supported, that they do not have access to decent work, and it's going to take a critical global shortage and turn it into a crisis if it already isn't a crisis. So, Patrick, thanks for making your case. We definitely will be coming back to you in the Q and A section. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce uh, Kim uh, Pokadel, um, who is uh, uh, the country director for Nepal, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, my name is Kim Pokhrel. I'm currently working as a country director for THET here in Nepal. Today, I'm talking about Nepal's roadmap to achieve universal health coverage and way forward. Next slide, please. So uh, we have uh, some uh, achieved the reduction of under five mortality rate, neonatal mortality rate, total fertility rate, and also stunting in the country. But still, we have a long way to go to reduce maternal mortality rate ratio, which is uh, 239 per 100,000 live births. So it was targeted to reduce um, 125, but we are still behind the maternal uh, mortality ratio declination. Next slide, please. So when we see the universal health coverage and uh, Nepal's status, uh, ISME uh, 2019 study has uh, shared that uh, Nepal's uh, service coverage index was 59%. And still 
there are 10.7 percent of people who spend more than 10 percent of their household total expenditure on health care it was uh, very old data and the uh, spending is um, uh, increased um, this years as well and current health expenditure is mostly driven by out of pocket expenditure it is as high as 60.4 percent and country ranks the highest in the category and there are access to essential medicine is at 72 percent in the country with within our essential medicine service free healthcare system next slide please so I'd like to talk about the analysis of human resource. Now, when we see the register number of doctors, there are 28,477 doctors, but only 3,212 are in currently employed. And the government is targeted to increase to numbers uh, um, by 10,855 by 2025. The gap between register and the currently employees is because of uh, some of are working in private sector and government is not uh, able to ret uh, have retention of the doctors and those are um, doing abroad work and even sanction posts in the government health system are not filled as well. And when similar case, we can see the nurses as well. There are 61,000 around nurses are registered, but only 18,662 nurses are working. And there are auxiliary nurse midwife who are not uh, truly nurse, but they are um, uh, trained for some like uh, some duration. And so um, even uh, when we include nurses and auxiliary nurse midwife, but um, the number is, is still low. And the government has targeted to increase 64,764 by 25. The problem is also there is sanction posts are not filled in rural areas and also mostly nurse go for abroad work. And midwife situation is very miserable in my country. There are only 14 midwives graduated and currently working and the government has targeted to increase midwife number only 150. Um, so what has been done uh, by the country to meet uh, or towards uh, the like strategy um, for U USCs? We have expanded service delivery sites in various part of the country, even rural areas and remote districts. And there are 3.3 million people have enrolled already in health insurance scheme out of 28 million people. And one staff crisis management center in all 77 district hospitals, which is dealing with gender-based violence and uh, survivor of the violence. And social service units established in 44 hospitals to provide the service for the poor. And there are geriatric care in 24 hospitals. And the government has increased 2% of GDP in health sector. It is still low. And per capita government is spending is increased from 11.3% in 2015 to 20% in 2020. So these are some of the progress towards USCs. But we have several challenges. Nepal is uh, uh, having with a very geographical barrier to access the services, such as maintaining of comprehensive emergency obstetric neonatal care services in remote and difficult areas. And we have limited population coverage under the health insurance program. I already shared only 3.3 million people I have access. And access to essential health services has been affected by COVID-19 crisis, especially for those high to risk population and vulnerable groups, women, and those who live in remote areas. We have limited availability of geriatric services and disability friendly services in our um, hospitals and the capacity of service provider is still low and um, to provide those services. Per capita government spending on health is increased very little from USD 4 to USD 6 
there is slow rise in government uh, health spending in relation to uh, government's commitment to leaving no one behind and achieve universal coverage. Um, some uh, budget has been increased uh, because of COVID-19, but essential health services uh, were compromised. Out of pocket expenditure remaining a dominant share of healthcare financing, which is around 60%. A fragmented approach to the management of various social health protection schemes, such as free health care program, free, health, free, free delivery, maternity schemes, health insurance, and so on. So there is delays in identification of poor and vulnerable, hampering inclusion of the poor and the other targeted groups in health insurance through government subsidy. So these are some of the challenges that faced uh, to achieve. So what would be the way forward for the country? The country need to ensure equitable availability and provision of basic health services, especially targeting to rural and remote areas. And there, need, there is need, uh, need to expand health insurance to all remaining districts and prioritize the enrollment of poor in the health insurance scheme with government subsidy. Currently, there is no uh, subsidy and um, government need to provide those poor and there should be scaling of uh, reproductive maternal neonatal uh, and child health programs for reaching hard to reach communities such as adolescent friendly services and voluntary service providers and for just producing roving auxiliary nurse midwife and also home visits should be one of the strategy to meet those household who are not accessed by the health system and free health care programs such as social service units, deprived citizen fund and maternity incentives should be increased and scaled up um, throughout the country. And there should be focus on reaching uh, on rich and marginalized vulnerable groups through localized JC strategies in current federal system. So the, this uh, could be done by government as has planned. Thank you so much for listening um, the country context of Nepal about USC roadmap. Thank you so much. Jane, thank you for uh, such a comprehensive presentation and giving us uh, really uh, hard data, dark realities in Nepal, highlighting again the critical role of health workers and how they're needed, but also pointing out to the fact of the, the, the dire situation, the out-of-pocket expenditure, and the fact that, you know, even the, especially the hardest to reach population still remain uh, not being the focus, and we're still struggling to reach them in Nepal. So uh, again, very, very insightful data. And again, hope to come back to you for the Q&A section in a moment. Um, uh, fin finally, but not least, uh, it really is uh, a pleasure to introduce Professor Sally Theobald, uh, Professor of Social Science and International Health at Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. Uh, and, and Sally, great to see you. I uh, see you here. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Rupa. So today is also International Human Rights Day with a focus on equality and reducing inequalities and advancing human rights as its themes. And obviously we have UHC Day forthcoming, leaving no one's health behind, investing in health systems for all. And these both link strongly to the themes of HEAL. And what I'm going to do is share some postcards from work around the world that focuses on equity, gender and human resources for health. And as we've heard from all the speakers today, COVID-19 has been described as a window, a syndemic, a portal, an X-ray, illuminating and also often and sadly amplifying existing inequities, be they gender, race, disability, sexuality, and as Rupa has said, that need for an intersectional lens. So next slide, please. And can you click on through the slide? Thank you. So a key message for me is that we will not reach universal health coverage unless we focus on fragility. And fragile contexts are critical, are growing. And as Rupa said, we also will not reach universal health coverage unless we integrate gender equity into everything we do in the pillars of universal health coverage. And human resources for health, it's a feminized field. Gender, power and positionality play out in complex ways. And I just want to spotlight community health workers. 
a largely feminized cadre, often under supported, under remunerated and under recognized in terms of their vital role in the health system, playing key roles in linking health systems and communities. COVID has brought an additional layer of responsibilities to this key cadre who enjoy trust with the communities they represent. And our earlier research has shown that they are well positioned to respond to the realities of communities and to address gender equity. So next slide, please. In Rebuild for Resilience, we have been doing work together with community health workers research to understand the challenges they face actually in context we've been talking about in Sierra Leone, in Nepal, in Myanmar, and also in Lebanon. And we need to ensure that community health workers are supported in their vital work, in their critical interface role, and they are too often neglected in training, in mental health support, in provision of PPEs, etc. So just some quick summary of some of the support that community health workers express that they need at this particular time. Next slide, please. So staying with the fragility, I want to just focus for a minute on Yemen. So Yemen has been referred to as the world's largest humanitarian crisis. Uh, Najla Al-Samboli, who you can see in this visual image, she says, what we need is to stop the war, open our borders and free our skies from their rockets, is alumni from Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. She is lead paediatrician at Al-Sabine Children's Hospital in Sana. Her bravery, her strength, her resilience reminded me of Sister April, who we heard this morning. Health workers in Yemen have not been paid for six years. They continue. We have a strong solidarity link between Liverpool and Sana. There's a very strong Yemeni community in Liverpool. This summarizes that. And Hamimu asked us to think critically about financial flows. And I just want to show you bottom left. Over the past de half decade, Britain has earned eight times more from arms sales to members of the coalition fighting in Yemen than it has spent on aid. And this is before the cuts of 56% to aid in Yemen this year in March. So I just wanted to share that solidarity and acknowledge the amazing strength of health workers at all levels of the health system in Yemen. Next slide, please. So please click on to the slide. Oh no, sorry. So this is our ARISE project, which focuses on equity, accountability, health and wellbeing and informal settlements. This is in Nairobi, in Kenya. Again, community health workers are key. So our partners, LVCT Health in Kenya, were asked to, through the National Technical Working Group of the Kenyan Ministry, to develop COVID-19 prevention messages for dissemination to community health volunteers around COVID-19 via SMS. They sent over 11,000 messages, to, sorry, messages to over 11,000 CHVs across 10 counties with strategies and messaging around COVID-19. Communities and households then had a number they could ring up for further support. What emerged from that was this focus on the increase in sexual and gender-based violence. And today is actually the last day of Orange the World, the UN Women Campaign Against Sexual and Gender-Based Violence. So those messages were then adapted to also include messaging and support around sexual and gender-based violence. So just highlighting the innovation, the responsiveness of community health workers to gender equity issues and how they play out. Next slide, please. And please click on through. So just to show, share as well, uh, this is a project which works in partnership with the Ministry of Health and all players in the health system in Liberia to address severe stigmatizing skin diseases and focusing on the importance of co-production, of working together, of understanding the realities that a wide range of health workers, including community health workers, including 
various traditional healers and including communities and their experiences, working together to understand realities and feed those into health systems priorities. Next slide, please. So COVID-19, climate change, they all are demonstrating that we live in an interconnected world. And solidarity now is more important than ever. We have to focus on vaccine equity. As Hamimu said, we also have to focus on ensuring the rights to make vaccines, to share vaccines. And we have to fight against aid cuts. I agree we need to think critically about the language of aid and what it represents, but we have to ensure that support and solidarity is there for the people who work so hard on the front line of our COVID-19 response globally and at all levels of the health system. And final slide, thank you. Just to share resources on gender equity and social inclusion in health systems and health system strengthening, they're available here. If you want to learn any more about these projects, please look at our website. And I've really enjoyed and learned a lot from the perspectives and the sharing today. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Sally. And just also for driving home the interconnected aspect of this agenda. There are so many issues that are pressing, so many areas we must address. But one thing that is continues to be lacking is really acting on global solidarity. We too often are talking about global solidarity, too often talking about equity, and yet our actions are not being backed up. And uh, the examples that you've shared, especially about the most uh, marginalized uh, community of health workers that have been so critical to addressing the pandemic, to building resilience um, in the pandemic, but also uh, in generally in health systems. And so again, uh, thanks for highlighting that. And while we're nearly at time, we do have uh, time for at least uh, uh, a round of questions and we have a question that has come in uh, from Diana Day uh, and I'd like to begin um, with uh, just kind of going top down from the list uh, asking Norma um, to kick us off with what would uh, your advice be especially uh, the first steps that should be taken to make sure that the voices of women uh, nurses and I would say community health workers um, are really heard in local health decision making so local health boards uh, what are some of the first steps we can do um, to really make sure that the expertise these health workers have where majority women are actually influencing decision making? Uh, so uh, I'm going to turn and see if Norma is able to uh, join us here and um, actually. Hi. Great. Good morning. Okay. Wonderful. Great. Wonderful. Norma, please kick us off. Hi, good morning, and uh, please accept my apologies for not being able to present live today. It's just that I have my two-year-old with me, and I thought that wouldn't work very well. Uh, but yes, thank you so much for the questions. I would say, um, from my perspective and experience, that the way that we can start uh, to raise those voices is actually to uh, make colleagues and uh, women aware that their voices are important, and it's to be heard. So uh, a lot of work that we've done in our trust and our communities were events where we supported women and our colleagues to um, share their opinions about the work that we were doing in terms of uh, the maternity services, uh, events uh, where um, service users and uh, members of staff engaged in uh, discussing how we could move forward our uh, services, how we could uh, change. And uh, we worked towards um, building that resilience of our colleagues and our women to, to, uh, to make them aware that their voices are important. So it's not an easy process and uh, we still have a lot of work to do. But I think the importance is to raise the awareness that um, their voices are important and must be heard. And I think also to support uh, in regards to our women, we did a lot of work with translation and service user information more accessible in different languages and uh, different formats, just to uh, make women in, in feel included and uh, for them to feel that their, their, their opinion was important. 
Thank you, Norma. So clear message on uh, valuing women, uh, changing the narrative around that and creating the enabling environment, all aspects of what a gender transformative environment should be. Uh, I'd like to turn next uh, uh, to Kim um, um, uh, to chime in as well. And also, you know, just uh, building on that question, I'd like to ask, you know, you talked a lot about the role of government. So what political leadership is needed in Nepal to uh, get to that next uh, level on their journey to universal health coverage yeah nepal has committed several like um, um, uh, declaration and also has gender uh, kind gender develop gender responsive budgeting and also they have jc strategy to implement healthcare system throughout the country but uh, leadership um, is not uh, in the policy implementation level, we have several policy drafted and we have signed uh, several kind of commitments uh, to provide uh, services to poor and also gender equitable services. But there is a strong leadership who can cater the um, like retention of health workers who are um, going abroad, mostly those who are um, who are from the urban background, they don't uh, go to the uh, rural and remote areas. So the leadership need to um, think about human resource, not production um, for their retention and also deployment in with the uh, clear incentive. Another is uh, related uh, to the catastrophic uh, expenditure of healthcare. So it is quite um, challenging and there should be enhancement of uh, social security system and also health insurance government leadership need to see that one. Um, yeah, this is my response in a short. Hey really clear and distinct points there about really investing in the health workforce in a manner that is also about retention. So while training is important, your numbers showed there are many trained health workers in Nepal, but not necessarily getting the jobs and the support they need. Also uh, driving home the point about the out of uh, pocket expenditure. I'd like to come back to uh, to Patrick. You know, you have a very um, you know fascinating journey of being able to have worked in um, a two national um, uh, countries and as, as a nurse and really understand the dynamics. Um, again, turning back to that question of how do we really transform power when it comes to uh, the context of health systems and really making sure nurses, especially women, women's expertise, but also the expertise of nurses is valued. Um, what, what type of uh, next actions are needed from your perspective? Uh, Patrick, you're muted. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. It is a combined uh, action because uh, one maybe we started with a national level. Uh, for me, if I'm a politician, really the next politician or next minister of health in my country should be a nurse, and not necessarily a doctor. A female nurse should be taking that helm. Maybe when she is in that position, she knows it from grassroots level what she has been doing how she has been marginalized and how she can be able to bring the others on board in order to make sure that the healthcare system in that country can become a change agent. And once that example is set internationally, I think other people also will lead it. The other aspect of it is also for developing countries to make sure that they come on conferences when it says International Nurses Day, let them come from developing countries so that female nurses will be in majority to come and really discuss issues. And then when they make plans, when they go back at grassroots level, they'll be able to implement those plans if their governments in their countries are capable of helping them. So therefore, in order not to delay your answers, it is a mixed message, but also it is something that we need to empower our mothers, our sisters, our aunties, and make sure that they take the word forward. Because coming from even traditional bath attendants in my country, it is mostly women. In fact, men hardly ever attend any child bath. And so why should we not give them so much power? Why should we not try to empower them to make sure that we educate them more and more? So thank you very much. If at all, I'll yeah. provide the answer. 
uh, Patrick, very concrete, very pragmatic, uh, a direct ask, make sure the next Minister of Health, and I would say not just in Sierra Leone, but in every country, is a nurse, a woman nurse. Um, it's about time that we do that. And also thinking about the platforms we have at the global and regional level, are we bringing the right people into the room? And I'd say definitely we're not at this point in time and a lot of work to be done on that. Uh, as we come to a close, Sally, I, I do have a question and I think you're the one panelist I could get away with asking this since it came from the audience. Uh, and finally, if Santa could bring you one extraordinary gift this Christmas, what would you ask for the Build Back Better or Build Back New or Build Back whatever version of building that we're doing moving forward in 2022, uh, bringing all these themes together? Wow, thanks, Rita. <laughs> <laughs> Am I only allowed one? Uh, I no, would say <laughs> we need the end of war, right? We need the end of patriarchy. We need the end of all of these systems and structures and strategies and the end of action that is bringing climate change. We need to showcase solidarity, support, learning across and between all of us in this globally interconnected world. And I think that is what the themes of HEAL speak to. Thank you. Thank you, Sally. That's exactly the list that I would I would want. And I, I think there's it's, this conversation has been way too short. Learned so much from each one of you, Patrick, Kim, um, Norma, you know, and, and Sally. It just has been too short, uh, but such a such a moment of inflection for us as we are on Human Rights Day. We're on Universal Health Coverage Day. We're still in a pandemic, um, and there's so many challenges we're facing. So let's use uh, opportunities like this to again connect with each other, continue to do the important work and uh, drive the political leadership that's really needed um, so that we end uh, many of these challenges that we're facing. Uh, again, thank you. And I'm turning it back uh, to Charlotte to continue on with the program. Thank you so much, Rupert, Sally, Patrick um, and Norma. Thank you. What an important panel discussion. And as Rupa says, one, again, that we should have gone on for hours longer, I think, um, following the contributions from this morning as well. I think what we've proven is that there's a real power in coming together and discussing these important issues and learning and listening to one another. So I'm delighted now to turn to our final keynote of um, the morning and now into the afternoon. So thank you all for staying with us. But I'm really delighted to welcome Lord Nigel Crisp, who is the co-chair of the All-Party Parliamentary Group on Global Health and a patron of that. Um, his work over the decades has been challenging. It has um, prompted movements and led um, movements like the Nursing Now Challenge, turning the world upside down. So I'm really pleased to welcome um, Lord Nigel Chris. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed, Charlotte. And I feel a bit guilty coming in at the end of this conference. And I apologize to earlier speakers that I've only listened to the last 20 minutes. Um, can I say that 20 minutes was great? Um, and I think one of the things that was great about it was it was grounded. It was about real life. It wasn't about sort of, you know, airy fairy, high, um, uh, highfalutin sort of things. It was actually about what happens in reality and, and on the ground. Um, uh, I hope I'm not going to repeat too much of what other people have said earlier on, but um, I will be, however, fairly brief. So you won't have to hear it repeated for too long. Um, I, and I am actually going to start with the big global picture because that's what you asked me to do. And I want to have two bits of context. I mean, the first one, of course, is COVID um, and how devastating that has been in so many ways um, and how remarkably people have handled it. And just hearing about Yemen health workers uh, working without pay for six years. I mean, it's a, I mean, that's extraordinary, but there's some indication of that almost in every healthcare system in the way people have responded. And those of us sitting at home and being able to work from home and not involved uh, clinically are extraordinarily grateful for, for what people have done. Um, three big points. One is, of course, inequalities and the inequalities that it's revealed inside countries, but also between countries. Second one is the economic devastation that it's uh, um, bringing about and, and how that is really causing major problems that go beyond health, of course, but actually impact on health in an enormous way. But the one I want to highlight is the staffing one. Interestingly, in the last 20 minutes, a lot of people have talked about staffing. Staff are the key resource. Money isn't staff are the key resource. Well, the Yemen example shows you you can have the staff without the money in the most extreme circumstances. Um, and I think one of the impacts of 
uh, of COVID is that people have realized that. And I fear that there's going to be a great competition for staff so that all the sort of bring, uh, yeah, the, the recruiting of staff from lower and middle income countries to higher income countries, I think is going to be increased. And I think that's a real issue that needs to be grappled with um, uh, globally um, over the next uh, two or three years, because it's already starting to happen. Second point on uh, a big picture point is on global solidarity mentioned by Sally and uh, indeed I'm sure by lots of others. Um, I wrote a book uh, 12 years ago, which you mentioned Charlotte called Turning the World Upside Down, which is what we can learn from other, from people in low and middle income countries about health. Um, and I wrote it at a time of hope. It was really quite interesting. We were preparing in that sort of period in the next few years, Obama was relatively new. We hadn't had Trump yet, hadn't heard of Trump most of us, thank God. Um, uh, and um, we had, um, uh, we're preparing for, for, for the, the SDGs and so on. And, and there were world leaders talking great stuff. Today, well, that's changed, hasn't it? Um, and most recently it's changed, of course, with the uh, vaccines rollout. I don't need to say anything about that. You've all talked about it before, I think. Um, but also, of course, at the climate change conference in, in Glasgow, where one of the failings, frankly, was the way that the rich countries didn't support developing countries. The 100 billion that was promised that all that time ago is now only going to be available in theory from 2023. Um, so there's a real cynicism around uh, global solidarity now, but the hope comes from people like you. The hope comes from the remarkable thing that people to people uh, around the place, the Liverpool example, because I happen to hear it, Sally, but there are, uh, are, are lots of others of people working and FETs working with, with Myanmar actually is, is I think remarkable. And, and scientists to scientists, and there's an awful lot to build on. And we should concentrate on building that solidarity, as well as, of course, trying to move the politicians. But we've got some barking mad politicians uh, around the world at the moment um, who aren't going to be moved by much, uh, apart from time. <laughs> um, but actually, let's build that global solidarity at the local level. Now, talking about universal health coverage within that, universal health coverage has come on quite a journey over the last, I don't know what it is, 10 years perhaps. It started as being all about money. Um, and that's partly, and that's why it's called universal health coverage, of course, because it sort of came around from a sort of insurance sort of uh, base model. And of course, as a Brit, I tend to think of universal health care rather than universal health, health coverage, because that's our tradition. Um, but happily that's moved on into talking about quality and the quality of the staff to pick up a point that has been made and getting the right things and now beginning to be it seems to be a focus on health not just on health services and health care um, and where we are today actually i think is is the absolute focus has to be on those health and public health systems and building those whatever our particular special interests getting involved in that because these things work together. Universal health coverage works with tackling NCDs, works with tackling emergencies and health security, and it works with tackling climate change. And we should be thinking about a green UHC. Um, and bear in mind that the health industry globally, mostly in the West, of course, contributes 4.4% of global carbon emissions or equivalent global carbon emissions. Um, so we've got a major cleaning up job to do in our own backyard. Uh, as it were. But I want to take it further in terms of universal health coverage. As we change our ideas about it, we've got to make sure it, it is rooted properly in primary and community care and where everything we learned from Alma Arta all those 42 years ago, or whatever it is. Um, but even further than that, in civil society and making that link between a healthy uh, individual and a healthy society. And, and we've got to get the employers We've got to get the, the schools and the educators, we've got to get the institutions of civil society alongside us as we develop UHC. And I hope that journey will move on into the area, I think, of, of creating health, the things that cause health as opposed to the things that cause ill health. So we need the wonderful services um, that are provided by the professionals, but we also need to get into that other area. Um, and that, I think, is overwhelmingly important so that UHC is so, uh, is something that, that communities do, not just something that health workers uh, care about. So quickly, three quick implications of this. Firstly, we really do need to get our act together. It's great that there are, is it three or four organisations organising this, um, but we need to be really inclusive about this, bringing in civil society, as I say. And let me tell you one sad story. When I was chairing Nursing Now, that great campaign, which we finished at the end of this year, uh, we wanted to join the UHC 
grouping at um, WHO, and we weren't allowed to because we were the wrong sort of thing. Um, and that's a real danger, you know. So we turned away, and we we we've, we've talked about UHC, but we didn't make it such a big deal. Um, we actually did other things because we weren't wanted. Uh, is how it felt. Um, and I think that's really important. There's a great um, uh, New England expression, or one I learned anyway from IHI, which is waste no will. Um, you know, when you're trying to do something, if somebody comes to you and says, hey, that's a great idea, I've got this idea, this is what you should do, and you think it's a rubbish idea, <laughs> you don't say, go away, <laughs> um, you're not one of us, you're not part of the mainstream, you say, hey, that's really interesting, let's talk about it. You keep the momentum, the energy, and after a bit, they realize it's a crap idea. Um, uh, but you're all still moving in the same direction. And that is really important. Really important that we make this as inclusive as we possibly can be, and not too purist about what we mean by UHC. Second big point is government. We, we're we all will have been talking in this meeting, I'm sure, about the responsibilities of the donors and the big rich governments of the world. But actually, all governments have a responsibility. And some of us with long memories will remain remember that almost 20 years ago, um, the heads of state in Africa signed the Abuja agreement that 15% of public health, of, sorry, of public expenditure in all their countries, or government expenditures in all their countries, would be on health. Still only two countries have achieved that. Um, so there's a real responsibility on local, i.e. sort of national governments, as well as on the people operating globally. And then the final point I want to make is that the path to UHC Whilst the principles are the same everywhere, the path is different. People have to follow their own paths. And we've still got a bit of a habit, I know, uh, if I still hear senior Africans telling me they have bright young people from development organizations telling them what to do. Actually, we have to be even better at listening and understanding the paths that are, are there and, and should be there. Um, uh, and I think of people like the weavers cooperatives in the Thar Desert in India and what they've been doing. I think of BRAC, that wonderful example of what they've been doing, not even a health organization, um, but what they've been doing to, to develop universal health coverage. And I think of something I came across the other day, um, which was the, and, and met with the people, which was the people who started up the Toronto Birth Center, which is the indigenous groups in, in Canada coming together and creating this birth center that was absolutely for them and for their culture and respected their traditions and everything that went with it. And it was their universal health coverage, it wasn't my universal health coverage. So we have to be careful we're not selling a UK or a US model or a European model of this or a Japanese model or any other. Um, and that we learn from each other because actually I think we can learn a lot from that Toronto example actually in the UK as it happens. Um, so my final three takeaway points from all of this, all delivered at a bit of a, bit of a uh, a, a, a high pace, uh, Charlotte, get you almost back on time, perhaps not, um, is the first one we do have to, as we push for universal health, health coverage, keep our minds open and, and open for new ideas, learn from each other. Um, there's a great amount to be gained from that. Another great IHI stay, statement, of course, is that everyone has something to teach and everyone has something to learn. We need to keep building the momentum not be discouraged by what's happening globally. And this sort of conference, I can hear you're building momentum here. Um, and if we can get these shared and inclusive goals, then we will succeed. Not today, not tomorrow. This isn't a Harry Potter moment where we wave a wand and, uh, and life changes. This is a generational thing. Um, but it is one of the great movements of our time. Um, and if we get it right, this will change people's lives over the next 20, 25, 30 years and we'll be in a very different place. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Lord Chris. Thank you for joining us. I know that you're between sessions as well. So thank you so much for coming in. I think you've managed to summarize um, almost three hours of the morning without with only listening to 20 minutes. So I think that's quite a phenomenal task. Well done. Thank you. Um, I think you've raised some extremely important points and I think listening has been one of the key thoughts that has come from today. There is so much more we need to listen to, respond to, and in the words of our founder, um, Sir Aldo Parry, we must be responsive and not prescriptive, which completely plays as well to your point around not taking our models and prescribing them to others. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm also really pleased because you've provided a brilliant segue into our last section of today, which is really turning all of this hopefully into action. And in the chat, somebody quite rightly raised um, a comment around quality and it's true. 
all of this must be underpinned by quality health services and it's um, become a key statement in our vision at the Tropical Health and Education Trust that this is about quality health care, not just about the provision of health care. So thank you for raising that. It, it's absolutely important that we remember quality is central to all of this. And I know that there are many on the call who champion quality improvement programmes as well. So thank you. So wasting no will, I hope. I'm going to hand over to my colleague Michelle and Summer now to talk a little bit about the HEAL campaign before we close this morning's session. So thank you so much. I'm going to hand over to Michelle first. Hi everyone. Um, so my name is Michelle Udall and I'm the Campaigns and Outreach Officer here at FET. Um, in July of this year, FET launched the Health Equity for All Global Health campaign called HEAL for short. Supported by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, this campaign seeks to increase support for UK age investments in global health. We aim to do this by championing the voices and experiences of health workers in the UK and in low and, low and middle income countries. Here at FET, we recognize that solidarity in global health is needed now more than ever before. To this day, half of the world's population cannot access essential health services. 100 million people are pushed into extreme poverty each year because of health expenses. Africa is home to the top 20 countries with the lowest life expectancy worldwide. And low income countries have only received 0.8% of the 4.3 billion COVID-19 vaccines administered globally. Despite this sobering reality, the COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted how powerful partnership is. From the rapid development of the vaccine to the vast health innovation seen across the sector, the global health community has made incredible strides which have only been achieved through solidarity, collaboration, investments in health and care workers. This campaign is open to all, so you don't have to be a campaigner or have advocacy experience to add your voice in support of global health investments. To support our community to take part, We've create, we have created an action pack for change with, which contains top tips, resources and guidance to help you challenge the status quo. You can take a look by clicking the link in the chat. Um, I will now hand over to my colleague Summer who will talk about the Health Advocates Network. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us. It's great to have heard from so many different perspectives from all across the world. So very quickly from me, um, I would like to introduce you all to our Health Advocates Network. So the network is rooted in our long term commitment to partnership in global health and to building stronger health systems in low and middle income countries. It's also a response to the weakening of support um, that we have seen for global health, um, most, most recently in the shrinking of the UK's aid budget. Um, so the network is open to those with clinical roles and non-clinical roles and um, it's designed to provide a platform for health workers to share their experiences. So if you feel inspired by what you've heard today and you want to add your voice in support of a healthier future for all, we invite you to sign up by using the link in the chat. We'll put that in the chat shortly. Um, the aim is for the network to become a go-to resource for organisations looking for spokespeople. So that might be advocacy organisations or media outlets. Um, and we're delighted that the network is already growing and we have individuals signing up from all across the world, including the UK, but also DRC and Uganda. Um, and if you belong to an organisation whose members might be interested in this network, please do share the opportunity with them, or you can reach out to us on comms at vet.org to discuss opportunities for a partnership. Um, so thank you all very much for your time and I'll hand back to Charlotte now. Thank you so much, Laura and Michelle. And um, hopefully now HEAL has become um, second nature to most of that communication. So hopefully the Health Equity for All campaign won't be a new one for you. But if it is, please do check it out. There's so much going on online and it will only um, grow more and more over the next coming months. So yes, we hope to see you there and we hope to see you on the Health Advocates Network. So our final call for today is really just to um, ask you to join us on UHD Day, which falls on Sunday, the 12th of December. Um, in coming together for UHC and fighting for health equity for all. Um, we have a pre-made tweet, which we would love for you to share um, through your channels. Um, and let's raise, the let's raise our voices, let's join together, let's waste no will at this important time and continue to listen and provide action moving forward. 
So my final thanks go to Access Global Health and Students for Global Health and all of our speakers today for joining us. Um, we hope that you found this morning and into this afternoon extremely helpful and there'll be lots I know to go away and continue to learn and listen from. So thank you all so much for joining us. We hope that you'll complete the feedback form on your way out as well. Um, and please do um, let us know if you have any other thoughts, comments or ideas of ways that we can all act on this together. So thank you so much on behalf of myself, Action for Global Health and Students for Global Health. Thank you.